So we're going to go for like three hours, right? As long as you want, man. Who are you? I, the last time I checked uh, my birth certificate the other day was Patrick Sheehan. And I have grown up as a musician in uh, a couple of different facets. I started um, as a generic school band student in fifth grade in 1990 as a saxophone player. Went on to study music education at Northern Illinois University uh, as a classical saxophone player and then ventured into clarinet in those years, and then went on to teach through an arts academy and school district in Northwest Illinois, uh, as this arts academy was just opening, and did a multitude of things. Did kindergarten general music, did middle school band lessons, and played for an assistant music directed for uh, the, the high school musicals and also accompanied for the choir and also played in a local municipal band. And up until recently, just about two years ago, uh, came back to my roots of the south suburbs of Chicago and uh, began working down here again, but did a short stint on the road with the Glenn Miller Orchestra. So uh, my life and my career has taken me to a bunch of different points, doing several different things. Jack of many trades, master of none, but uh, thoroughly enjoyed the, the different chapters that I have been through. And I don't know what the future will bring, but it will probably bring a peppermint of all of, uh, all of those things. Nice, nice. Part of, why, part of why I'm having Patrick here on the show is um, because of his uh, diverse, uh, diverse work experience. Uh, and I've talked to some uh, previous guests, doc, Dr. Barrett, our, our mutual uh, colleague. Um, I, met, I met Patrick at Northern, I believe it. Well, we, we have a mutual colleague for one, but also um, I remember working with you through the clarinet cornucopias, right? Correct, yep. Um, so clarinet cornucopia, hopefully they'll, they'll do it again. Uh, corona times are unusual, but uh, True. it's a great, uh, it's a great local or relatively local resource for, for uh, all different clarinetists, different levels to, uh, to come play together, learn from each other. Usually there's a great guests and, and opportunities to play. Um, so that's where I think, I think that's where we originally met. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that's the first time we worked together, Frank, and we, okay. um, uh, you know, we did meet through a, a mutual friend of ours from who came to Northern and I was at Northern with for, uh, he was there for a short time, but he originally came from Western Illinois, which is where you were. So I had heard about you through him and then we finally got to work together. And I think I called you up to play a municipal band concert, uh, play an E flat part for something because I was the E flat player, but uh, I had to play piano on some tunes, so we called you in to, to fill in that seat, which, of course, you did an excellent job. And uh, everybody up there loved you, too, and as you ate your chicken. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's I think that's our yeah. history in a nutshell. I, um, like I said, I'm glad, I'm glad Patrick could make it on because uh, one of the recurring themes in, you know, we've only had a, a handful of shows so far, but one of the recurring themes that's come up is the diversity of a music career nowadays. I mean, nowadays, 2020, but, um, you know, the last, at least the last decade or more, it's become even more, it seems to me it's become more diverse. People aren't only teaching, aren't only playing. There's a lot of different, you know, the, the freelance world, you get your hands into a lot. Um, so, uh, you know, seeing your career play out as it has so far, um, I know you have a lot of value to share with, with people looking at building a career now um, and just seeing, seeing what it could become, or at least seeing what, what yours has played out to be, uh, maybe give some people some ideas. Um, so you mentioned you got started, you were, you were one of the, 
the the league of of uh, elementary band kids back in the day um what when you uh when you started clarinet was it i know you you started saxophone first but was it because you you wanted to double or was there any particular goal in mind when you picked up clarinet well, the reason actually that I, I picked it up for the first time, and I wouldn't say every clarinet player that I've ever spoken to has t taken this route, but I think a lot of saxophone players have. And the reason that I, I began uh, getting into clarinet was with the low voice clarinets, with bass, contra alto, contra bass. I played those in the, you know, which are two different schools of thought on that. Some band directors think that those are extra instruments and lots of times now with the publications that are being put out, um, I wouldn't say that they become instruments of the past. That would be unfortunate if they did, mm. but they're not being scored for anymore. The, the older works from maybe the seventies on back, you saw a nice full clarinet section, but anyway, I'll try not to tangentiate if that's a word but um yeah so I, I played saxophone in the the top win group at niu and in the second group since that met at a different day different time i was able to uh play bass clarinet and some contraparts uh, playing that playing that wind literature just to get a feel of the instrument and how the similarities because of course whoever you know you, you could be a flute player and they're always going to compare in their mind okay you know this fingering is the same as this and all that right. so and as we know that saxophone and clarinet fingerings are, are somewhat comparative so uh and then i kind of got through into the fire when i started teaching because when i was doing middle school band lessons saxophone really wasn't the best versatile instrument to play with students that were playing different families you know if i had a lesson with a trumpet player or a low brass player it, it really did seem to work better by getting a, and i had never owned a soprano i had really never played soprano clarinet at all so i went ahead and bought one and i still regret it the kind that i got of course oh. um and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a bit but uh that really worked with versatility in, in lessons and, you know, transposing parts as you're playing along with students. Mm. So, and I knew that I had to do it anyway. And I'm glad that I did because it's not that I was tired of saxophone, but I did study it a lot and play it a lot in college and high school, of course. So I, uh, I thought, okay, I need to branch out and do something new and do the woodwind doubler thing. It was high time to do that. Of course, it was 19 years old or whatever. So, or I'm sorry, no, it was after that. Um, when I started teaching, it was the uh, fall of 2005. So I was about, I was 25. So I got a Selmer uh, B flat soprano and it was something I was kind of wheeled uh, and, and dealt into by the, the school representative. Yeah. I really did want a buffet because I had touched them. I had had them in my hands and the feel is just, it, it just feels so good. And I was trying to get that rep to say, well, you know, can you give me a buffet? Well, this is a better deal. And, you know, it's kind of like a car salesman. It's part of their job. It's what yeah. they have to do. So, uh, but to this day, I still don't really like the feel of that horn, even though it's my only and primary instrument besides a metal clarinet, which I did use outside. Um, the tone holes I feel on a Selmer, I think Selmer makes great instruments for saxophones. When it comes to clarinets, a buffet is really the top of the line. I have a buffet C clarinet which I wish I could play a whole lot more often and sight transpose, but, um, you know, lots of us get complacent with that. And we don't want to do it, but, uh, the feel of that is just so much better. And my, my E flat is a LeBlanc and I like the feel of that how much better. The tone holes on the summer are just, they just seem too big. And I'm, you know, I'm blessed with very thin piano fingers. Mm -hmm. So not that I have an issue covering the holes, but I've just never really cared for the feel of it. Right. And, um, I, I may send a few cringes your way, but um, when I was looking for a good mouthpiece, I did have a lesson with Greg Barrett and he recommended a Van Doren M40 for classical playing. So I, uh, I got that and got a Bernard ligature. And, you know, we all know the, um, as part of your audience is going to half agree, half disagree, but we all know that the bane of cane reeds and how living here in the Midwest with all the different, temperature and humidity changes you know i don't know pressure plays into it but um when i was playing a municipal band 
mostly outdoors 10 weeks in the summer when some summers it would get blazingly hot. Uh, I always had a cane reed on, I use Van, Der, Van Doren's and I use three or three and a half. I always used a cane reed on the E flat, but I would also play B flat parts if there happened to be a work that, you know, as we know, doesn't have an E flat part. So, or if I had a long extensive rest, I'd put the E flat down and pick the B flat up and on the B flat, I started using a Leger because I am one of those people, I firmly believe in sanding, tabling, evening it out, and there's a whole science to that. Everybody goes through that. Every woodwind player goes through that in their applied study in college. But, you know, when it comes down to it, whether you're inside or outside, I am one of those people that refuses to what I call fight, fighting an inanimate object, yes, getting, yeah. the, getting the instrument to speak. I just, I, who wants to do that? So I thought, okay, if I'm just going to be picking up this horn mostly now, to play here and there a little bit and mostly E flat. I'll have the cane read on E flat. Never even experimented with a Leger on E flat, really, honestly. Um, but I, you know, if I'm going to pick up the B flat here and there to play it, I don't want to fight it. So I kept it and I even used it on the road. Um, and some will say that it's not, it doesn't have the best tone. But as you were talking about with uh, Dr. Ginsburg and Dr. Barrett, the way we're all built, you know, the, the instrument is an extension of our body. I always used to say to my students, I wish that we could, that we could have like glass cheeks so we could see what's going on inside their mouth, where their tongue is, how they're tonguing. Yeah. It would make and, some things a lot know, easier. Yeah, it sure would. And to, you know, to see their airflow and all that angle is a big thing about that. But in any event, um, you know, using, using Leger, you know, it's, it's all about tone is a lot about how you're made inside, I think, and, and what you're doing with your throat at all times when the horn is on your face. So um, I, I don't think some players think about that. They think it's all about setup. Yes, but no, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it has, there's a big part of setup. Certainly uh, it has to work, it has to feel right for you, et cetera. Um, but I was talking with Ginsburg the, for the, the previous episode um, and we were talking about spe specifically the vocal elements of, of not just clarinet, but musicianship uh, and how um, there's a lot of concepts that tie in, but I've, I've always felt like, you know, like you were saying the, the anatomical portions of that, you know, resonances and where you, how you wear and how you direct sound. I, I always felt like that was, at play as well. Um, but, Absolutely. You know, but yeah, I mean, and, and talking about uh, Leger and other synthetic reeds, like, um, yeah, I went through, I went through similar, I think it was reverse. I ended up, I'm, I'm playing more, more on B flat and A because I'm mostly orchestral playing. Um, but there were occasions where I got called to play E flat or bass. So for a while I kept the Leger reed for those because um, I knew what it would do. I didn't, I didn't have to fiddle with a uh, cane reed uh, for, you know, the occasional concert. Um, but, you know, at some point um, feel one for, for me, feel one over predictability. Uh, and I ended up back on cane for those. And, and, you know, it's preference. There's, there's choice and consequence for those things. Right. Uh, but, you know, if you've if you've been back and forth on those those um, you know synthetic versus cane, you, you kind of a, you, you build a reliable feeling for what's going to work for you for which context. Certainly, like um, I remember the uh, municipal band setting. You know, like if I if I were between having to go inside and outside all the time, I definitely would spend more time on the synthetic. Because I, I just wouldn't, I, I'd barely trust my own clarinet, let alone the reed part. You know? Well, I was going to say about uh, the metal clarinet, and this is, you know, a lot of people giggle about that, but this is where this really came in handy. So here's a story, you know, for y'all. Uh, there was one particular summer, and this doesn't happen every week, but, you know, you have those fluke days where you have a little, you know, three-day heat wave, and right. the humidity's way up, and temperature's like 95, you know, we're all sweating bullets. And at the end of the concert, now I brought, 
I would bring in uh, a tote bag with my ProTech B flat case. My uh, it looks longer than it actually should be the uh, the E flat case, which had a shoulder strap and uh, two Hercules peg stands. So I bring that in my reed case, all that, and I bring that in and you know set up my horns, play the concert, and at the end of that this one particular concert the middle tenons of, you know, you just do it by habit and you're taking your horns apart. This thing would not come apart. And I thought, okay, a little more elbow grease. So I, I'm real careful about, I'm really careful about rods just personally and key work and all that. Right. And I always have them well greased so they come apart easily still was not coming apart. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to fight this. I don't want to snap anything because I'm going to have to be without my horn for a week or more. So I gently put it, I ranged stuff in my bag. So I gently put it in the corner of my bag and waited until it got into air conditioning. And then I don't think like, even later that night it would come apart. So I got it apart the next morning and I thought, okay. A couple years earlier, I had seen a metal clarinet, a Holton in an antique shop window bought it purple fur inside the case, you know, yes. bought it one piece and it was all tarnished and everything. And it sat, I just wanted to have it just to have it. I was going to do the typical thing and make a lamp out of it like everybody else. But I thought, you know what, here we go. So I took it to um, a place in the uh, quad cities that was, uh, that had a good repair shop. This gentleman did a fantastic job, shine the whole thing up repatted the entire thing, $250 it cost, and it looked like it could be a part of the Tin Man. It looked that good. Oh, wow. And I was very surprised. So I put my, and it's got a, a weird kind of barrel on it, and just the way it's made. And I put my M40 and my regular setup on it. And it, it does have, if you're to describe the tone, you can go into a whole science of it. Does it sound like a wood clarinet? No. Does it sound like a metal clarinet? No. Um, it's somewhere in between. So, and again, I didn't play it that much, but on the pieces that I did play it, I was sitting third on sometimes third or fourth on in from the principal because the uh, RE flat set in the front row. And uh, so whenever I was playing it, you know, I'd fit in or I'd play just a little bit under, but Hey, you know, who wants to have that problem, you know, with, with temperatures. So I thought, you know, so, uh, bypass a, a repair that you don't need to do because I snapped something. So I just thought, you know, just for fun and, and use it. Why not use it? If I put that kind of money into it and I bought it in the window for like $45, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tongue in cheek, but Hey, if it works, why not? And that's what they were originally intended for. Yeah. So yeah. And now, and now it sits in storage. <laughs> nice. I, I have one of those lying around somewhere, a metal, um, yeah, I had a, I forget who now, but I had had a repairman uh, make it playable and I got chewed out afterwards. Like never said, never take one of these to me ever again. <laughs> um, no. But it's, it's a, it is an interesting thing. And, um, you know, I've encountered some metal clarinets that were, uh, they were, they were produced by like, like high level uh, flute manufacturers. Like, you know, uh, they're not in circulation now, but you know, some of those are really like when you, when you do clean them up, they get, they, they're really good instruments. Um, and there's surprisingly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's something about something about the metal metal sound, like you were saying, uh, if it's, if it's well-made and metal, there's a unique quality to it. Um, yeah. but you know, I, yeah, not, not frequently seen anymore. Maybe, uh, maybe we can break them out and do a, uh, metal clarinet collab recording one day <laughs> if you can ever find sure storage uh, storage uh, nether regions again play uh play some heavy metal for rap right? yes there we go we have our album album name right there, there um go. anyways uh that's good you uh you've had a pretty diverse career a lot of uh different different settings for um you know the working musician um can you single out any best and worst days at work that you want to share from any of that span of, of job experiences? Yeah, right off the bat. Um, well, let me, let me go through the stages first so that, I mean, you can kind of see this in order. 
grade school and right after I, about a year after I started playing saxophone, a lot of people don't know this about my background, but uh, I went to Catholic school, Catholic grade school and Catholic high school. And um, one day at church on a Sunday, I had seen a flute player play with the organist. And I thought, you know, young pup, I had only been playing for a year. I thought, can I do that? So we went up and talked to the organist and he says, yeah, you know, uh, bring, you know, this is what we're going to do. Bring your instrument next week and we'll run through a couple of things and you can play. And ever since June X of 1991, uh, I, I've been a church musician. And of course, in these recent years on and off, but uh, that is where I learned how to site transpose because I didn't, I ended up not writing the stuff all out. Um, you know, I'm playing everything within the Catholic mass if, for those that are familiar with that. Um, then went on to high school and uh, to Marian Catholic High School in Chicago Heights for the well-known uh, uh, concert band and marching band programs and uh, competed in Bands of America and uh, was in bands under Greg Bim and Mark Whitlock at the time. Uh, Greg Bim is in his uh, 43rd year, I believe there. He's been there oh, since wow. 1977. So, um, in any event, uh, then after that, uh, NIU as a music ed major and uh, saxophone with uh, a very, very good quartet. I have to send you some materials on that because I, I failed to, to give you those, but uh, more on that in a bit. And then uh, teaching at the Arts Academy and um, uh, did a lot of musical theater within those years as well, some community and then within the schools. Uh, and then, you know, with private teaching and then teaching in the schools and then uh, coming back here to the suburbs. And uh, right now, since uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra is off the road since March, uh, I've been an organist at a local, not the church that I grew up at, but another lo local church in town and getting involved there uh, and was already called to do some musical accompanying uh, back in the spring before everything was canceled. So, you know, called for that, but then got, uh, you know, bumped by nature. So uh, those, those were all the stages with that, but say a good day at work. Um, I really, really enjoyed um, doing musical theater. Uh, rehearsals can be a bear sometimes just because there's so much going on and it just depends on how much time uh, the director allows to put the show together. That could be six weeks, that could be 12 weeks, it could be 24 weeks, some people go a very long time. But it can be intense, but once you get the pit orchestra in there and working all that together, and kind of like making your own faux Broadway recording, which is what I always thought of, that's a genre of music that I've always really liked doing. Um, and on a, a teensy negative side of that, uh, it's any, any piano conductor will tell you that it's really mentally taxing to play and conduct with your head at the same time while wearing a headset yeah. uh, to do all those. Three. You really don't need the headset because it's, you know, those cues have nothing to do with you unless an emergency happens and then you got to have it on. But um, if I had to do it all over again, I definitely get a pianist to uh, not really play for the show. That's it, the piano should really be eliminated during the show and it should just be down to the winds. I mean, the rehearsal piano should be eliminated. It shouldn't be covering everything in true form. And I'm a purist that way. But in any event, uh, I really love doing that stuff. Really, really love traveling with the Glenn Miller Orchestra just because I was in one spot for too long. As a kid, you go on vacations and you, and, you know, uh, you visit different states or parks and stuff like that. And, and you can enjoy getting out of your state and doing it, you know, at that age. But, you know, after being in one place for so long and then basically going from Seattle to Boston and Minneapolis to Corpus Christi, it's, uh, that was really, really cool. And um, so that's that. Bad days. Uh, the bad days were the days where uh, students would cancel the private lessons at the last minute and I'd be sitting at the academy doing this. Yeah. Um, or when a student wasn't, uh, was just kind of spinning their wheels and really wasn't uh, making any progress in doing that. That's, that's arduous to do. I'm glad you, and on the glad flip you side, it that way. Sorry. I, I'm glad you phrased it that way. Spinning the wheels. Uh, I use that constantly when I run into the same type of student. Um, or even sometimes I'll get some that are more dedicated, but they don't understand how to work. So they're just playing and playing and playing, but they're not really like practicing, really practicing. They just 
play, play, play. Um, but the, yeah, it's it's nice to hear it put uh, the same way from uh, from somebody else that uh, you're working so hard and going nowhere. Um, but yeah, don't do that. Spinning the wheels. <laughs> Uh, I will I will touch on a lot more of that because I did want to talk about um, some observations that I made in my teaching years mm -hmm. that I feel are really important that we that we all need to be aware of. And I think, as we know, experience is the best teacher. You can have one degree or three degrees. But until you get out there and actually do it and walk in those shoes, then you know what's up. Yeah. And there's there's we all have our personal experiences. So I want to touch on a couple of those and how I fix them just to make, I think everybody needs to be aware that as music teachers, if we're not doing our job, we hear the results. You know what I mean? Right. And if we hear bad results, I take that as a reflection on me. What did I do wrong in that regard? So yeah, the bad days, um, the other thing to, to do a flip side of, of what I said about musical theater is that part of my job at the Arts Academy was to, uh, since there wasn't, the Arts Academy was created because there was a tax referendum in the schools that cut a lot of arts personnel and it wasn't gonna come back. So that's why the Arts Academy was created separately and that staff was put into the school system, the local school system. Um, in town. It really didn't branch out to other counties or anything. So part of that was that they offered stage musicals to grades three, four, five as one cluster, grades six, seven, eight as another cluster. And because that wasn't offered in the middle school. So um, to do those, uh, for those that know and those that don't, Music Theater International, MTI, has written a, a couple good handfuls of classic musicals but abridged so they're only about 45 minute shows from not two hour shows they don't have an intermission some scenes are cut out some songs are cut out so it just makes it a little more compact for younger minds to mm -hmm. richard lewis younger minds to uh to comprehend and this the songs are a little bit truncated but the good and bad in that is that um there is no live pit there's a piano rehearsal score but there is no live pit. You have to put in a CD of their really good arrangements, really hot arrangements, especially like the production numbers. So they're specially written and recorded for that show CD. So you pop in the CD. So the kids have to sing along to a CD. And as I, I uh, bluntly and frankly say, it's like a big karaoke show. But that's from a person who really believes in having a pit orchestra in order to make it really a show. Mm -hmm. so having to conduct along with a CD from the back of the room to do that is the only way it could be done. But so if I had my choice, I would not do those MTI shows anywhere in the future just because of that. Um, so it, it, that was the part of my job I did not enjoy. Um, so that's, you know, if I had to say the, the bad days, you know, the kids were good. The kids had a very good work ethic and they, they memorized their stuff real quick. But uh, having to do that, and, you know, I did have the thing where the CD skips, like, what do you do now in performance? <laughs> you know, so it's uh, like, technology. okay, we got to start over, you know. So uh, electronics are great. I use electronics every minute of my day, which is uh, hence the uh, bags, you know, like that. <laughs> so, um, you know, they can do so much, so many wonderful things, but you cannot replace an organic human acoustic musician. So I may be old fashioned in that way and that's, I'm fine with that, but that's, that's how I can sum that up for you. That's Cheers. Yes. Um, can you, do you think you can single out any one proudest moment on the job so far? Um, I mean, there's a lot, you've been into a lot and I'm sure you've had plenty of, of great experiences, but is there any one that really stands out? Well, it's connect. Yeah, it's connected with, um, I can name several and it's, it's only because these are sort of household names, uh, and or places when with the Sterling municipal band, the reason it used to be a good ensemble is that under that regime, 
they brought in very big name guest players and guest conductors, military guest conductors like Colonel Lowell Graham, Colonel mm. Alan Bonner, and uh, composers like Brian Balmages, Johan DeMay, or DeMay, whichever you prefer, and uh, Robert Sheldon. And the guest artists that we had uh, over the couple of years were uh, tubist Patrick Sheridan, uh, trombonist Harry Waters, uh, Blues Brothers saxophonist Lou Marini, and Blues Brothers trombonist Tom Malone. So uh, when Lou Marini came out, uh, as we know in the concert band literature, we have solo and concerto works for a particular instrument. But since Lou specializes in flute and flutes and saxophones, he really doesn't play a whole lot of clarinet. He wanted something like custom written, and that's very hard to find unless mm. you commission it. So uh, I arranged two medleys for him that we performed. One was a uh, medley of about four or five Blues Brothers tunes from the movie. And he likes uh, Henry Mancini's music a lot. So I think I took uh, seven or so uh, tunes of his choosing and molded them all together and did a medley of that. Both were about 10 or 15 minutes long, but since he was a guest, you know, that's why it was so long winded. So he, he switched back and forth between tenor saxophone, alto saxophone, piccolo, alto flute, C flute, and soprano saxophone. So we agreed, we talked about it, we agreed on, okay, we'll do this horn here, we'll do this switch here, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he has since used that with, he's performed it in Ohio, I think with a community band out there a couple of years ago, he rents it from me every time that he performs it. And uh, he just recently, I got the chance to play with him again at the, uh, with the Wheaton Municipal Band at Wheaton, Illinois, two summers ago, no, last summer of 19. And um, did the same exact two pieces because again, that literature isn't out there unless you find an arranger to do that. Yeah. So that was just such a cool experience to have a guy of that stature come to our little town and play that music that so many people know, you know, yeah. uh, that's where it can really hit with an audience. That was a great experience playing with Tom Malone, you know, with his fame on Blues Brothers and then David Letterman was also very cool. Um, and then being on the road uh, with Glenn Miller, uh, so far, uh, we did a battle of the bands in Morristown, New Jersey. I want to say this was May of 2019. And uh, it was us and the Cab Calloway Orchestra. Cab yeah. Calloway, of course, of Blues Brothers fame and, and his own fame. And his grandson, Christopher Calloway Brooks, is the guy that's running it now. It's almost a spitting image of Cab. It's kind of spooky. But uh, really nice guy. Very good band. And James Carter. The, the tenor sax player was sitting in with him that night. Mm. Huge. That was, that was a surprise. None of us knew that, but so that was cool to play with him. And uh, some of the venues that I had played on the road, one that really stands out. Uh, we played three consecutive nights there in Seattle was a Ben Royal hall in Seattle where the Seattle symphony plays beautiful venue, very deep and, and just such a surprise because audience absolutely packed full, absolutely packed. So when you have that kind of audience and that kind of energy and they are half so happy to have you there and appreciative of what you're giving them, that's the high, you know, it's all over then. It's just, it's great. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I enjoy those moments. Uh, yeah. It's a particular type of energy uh, with uh, live performers, uh, live audience. And when it, when it clicks, it's very, very rewarding. So that's, that's what it's about. Nice. Um, Cool. Now, you're you're on multiple instruments, uh, so maybe this one uh, you can expand a little bit more on. Uh, you want to tell us about some of your teachers uh, across? I mean, we know each other through through Dr. Barrett, um, right. but you know you've been on you've been on hands on with other instruments. Uh, you want to talk about any of them? Yeah, um, my. Uh really i think the first private teacher i had uh as a young student outside of school was the organist at my church um robert Marcus. he's been a uh, an organist at that church for 30 years 
And um, what I learned from him, I started taking piano from him probably in, I was probably 12 in 1992 or so. And uh, the, the unique thing about Robert is that he's, uh, he's got a bachelor's and a master's in piano performance from DePaul. And for those that know, uh, church, sacred music, you know, basic hymns and things like that are meant to be written basic, you know, a basic harmonic structure. You'll pull, you'll open up a hymnal. First thing you'll see is amazing grace. And there's like three chords in it. It's almost like a yeah. blues tune. It doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. Right. With the harmonic progression. Once I heard, I can't tell you when the first time I heard it, but with the first time I heard him play Amazing Grace, the chord structure that he put in front of it or behind it or whatever put within it, it's so colorful because he was filling in all the gaps, mm. not making it weird or too out there, right. but filling in all the gaps to not sit on, uh, you know, sit on the same chord for four bars, which is the way it's printed. So he really kind of reinvented the wheel with everything that he played. He hardly ever played what was in the book. And at that moment, at age 12, it's like, okay, I guess this is okay to do. Mm -hmm. And with, his, with, with having to sight transpose on saxophone, I would have to give him my hymnal or my material, my, all my music before mass, he'd have to pencil in all the chords that he'd use, and give them back to me. Because if I played the wrong note, I'd be wrong you know, to him. <laughs> So, um, and I've heard quite a few music directors and, and pianists and organists in the South Suburban area, and it's, it's not to condemn anybody, but everybody plays what's in the book. He's arguably one of the best music directors in the South Suburbs of Chicago, which is a major diocese in the country. Uh, I'm not saying that because I know him, it's because I know what's up. Yeah. So I am indebted to him for all of that theory and ear training that I got before college, because that's what I basically what I was doing. My um, I come from a family of musicians. I'm the youngest of five. Uh, the oldest was a drummer. The second oldest was a uh, played tuba and electric bass. The third one is still a timpanist in two orchestras. The fourth one also played saxophone, and he's the one that's been on the Glenn Miller Orchestra for over 20 years. And then me. So uh, I took saxophone lessons with a gentleman named Bob Frankich, uh, who gigs around and plays uh, and teaches at some schools here in the South suburbs. And he's still teaching um, more of a jazz guy. And I started studying jazz with him, the, the Charlie Parker Omni book and started playing mm -hmm. all of those mm -hmm. tunes and getting that style down. And um, he also plays classical, but jazz is really his focus. So I, that was my first exposure to that. And I owe him because of that. I owe a lot to him for that. And I took lessons with him until I went away to college. Cause then of course it just wasn't fe feasible. Um, and at college I studied with Steve Duke uh, with classical saxophone, who is also well known as a very prominent crossover artist. Mm -hmm. The guy can play jazz just as, just as hard, just as bad as he can play classical. Uh, very intense teacher was very demanding, but that's the reason I went there. Um, and I didn't go there. Some people might still think that I went there on my brother's coattails, but my brother, Kevin was a jazz performance major. So that was his thing. It's not that I didn't like jazz, but he had started way before me and he's got that touch way better than I do. Mm. You know, it doesn't filter down the family bloodline. And um, you know, I was more classically oriented. So that's why I went there. The, um, I won't say their names, but uh, I won't say the other universities either, but the other schools that I auditioned for just seemed, they seemed too, for me, you know, very hoity-toity and uh, very selective and rightfully so. Um, and I'll say at this point that I enjoy playing. I get a lot of enjoyment out of playing whatever instrument I'm playing. Uh, but I have to make sure I'm doing it well. And I think it's safe to say that in the performance world, I had enough sense before I started college, because of course you have to pick a major. Well, do you want to be education, performance, therapy, whatever? And I knew even before I got out of high school that I 
didn't want to put that much time, uh, very honestly, into an instrument to be a performance major and to have that be my life and my career and my support mm -hmm. system. Because I knew that there were, and it wasn't a competition thing, but it was a, it was a, just a realization because I knew there were other, at that point at age 18, I knew that there were other people around me that could play a whole lot better. I'll come back to that because you asked about teachers. Um, in mid high school, uh, went to some band camps at, uh, hosted by Bands of America. And the, you did some quartet stuff, played in ensembles, it's a week long thing. And uh, Lynn Clock from the University of Massachusetts Amherst was the saxophone um, guy that they brought in for a number of years and did summer study with him. He, of course, it'd only be a week, but what a fantastic player. Taught me um, how to take, it sounds lame, but taught me how to take a good breath. He studied you, he looked at you and studied you as you're holding the horn, looking at your post posture, and I'd take a breath to re ready to play a phrase for whatever I was playing, and he'd say, nope, that wasn't a good breath. And I'm looking at him like, how can you tell that? <laughs> but it really made you think about it because yeah. that is your, besides your technique and your articulation and your setup and your tone, that's your best tool. And that was kind of an, an epiphany moment that, wow, yeah, it is. And there's a lot of people, you may know some as well, that really kind of play in their own bubble. They don't want to be, they're playing an ensemble, but they don't want to be heard by the people around them. Yeah. And I, they're not using their air to their fullest potential. I feel like um, when I've run into that the most is um, my, my students who play in a, in a school band because there's like 10 clarinets and they don't feel obligated to play any louder than their little bubble because there's, because it's by numbers. It, right. Like some of my, what I concentrate on a lot, like you were saying is, is the air, um, you know, kids get, kids get mystified when I tell them like they sound nice, but now I want two times the air, 10 times the air, whatever, you know, and try to make it so, so huge in their brain, but just to realize what they're capable of putting into the instrument, you know, um, but yeah, that, that air, the lesson of air is such a crucial thing, but I feel like maybe if kids did some more like maybe small ensemble, or if we had more opportunity to play in orchestra settings that they might realize that they need to play more, uh, bigger or like outside themselves in those settings. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's practical cause you're, you know, you still have to run your program and they, you can't like, it's, Maybe um, the logistics of it uh, might yep. be a little difficult, but um, yeah, especially with band kids, the one of the biggest things I've ever talked to them about is coming out of themselves and blowing air in their instrument. You know, um, yeah, and it it doesn't come. One of my stock phrases that I used because it's so useful that I use with my private students all the time was, "It's not going to come overnight." Mm -hmm. But you always have to keep it in mind and you always have to work on it. And don't worry, I'll remind you uh, to use your, you know, I always used to tell them, I want you to play as big as possible now. I don't care if it's just us because you can always bring it back later. Think right. about blowing up a balloon. You're going to blow up a balloon to be this big around. And once you start letting go of the bottom, it can go. That's what we're going to do later. But for now, I want you to do this. I did voice lessons as well. A lot of people like to sing in their own little bubble. Oh, we're just in this little room. Mm -mm, you can't do that. I want it big now. Then we'll learn how to control it. I want you to blow yourself out of the water, whether this be voice or a wind instrument, basically both wind. Then we can bring it back. Yep. Um, so the more that you and I were talking about setting this up and doing this, doing this talk, <coughs> excuse me, it made me think about, uh, if you don't mind if I divert, it made me think about a lot of, as I said earlier, a lot of the personal experiences I had with teaching in, in different settings with different ages of people. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, and it's not to condemn any group or any individual teachers at all, and I won't mention names or places, some places, but we really need to listen to the product that we're getting. We need to know 
how to fix that right now. They will work on it. It's not going to come overnight, but they will work on it. But we have to know how to fix that. If we don't know how to fix that, whatever that may be, Mm -hmm. we're really not doing our job. And to be very honest with you, Frank, I've noticed this sliding downhill maybe the past two decades. You know, we're, we're about age 40 now. We don't know it all. We don't have doctorate degrees in our instruments. But if we observe these things, sometimes it's hard to say them out loud for fear of offending somebody, especially in political times as such as now. But I am a person that does this and call a spade a spade. Yeah. If you want honest progress, you have to. I mean, that's right. That's why? right. Um, that's, uh, we were, uh, particularly with, uh, Ginsburg, we we're talking about our mutual experience with, uh, Cal Opperman. I remember and that. Yeah. He had, I mean, you know, he, he loved, you know, like he would, he gave of himself, uh, you know, wholeheartedly to his students. However, he was, he did not pull punches with what he heard or what you were doing. Um, and I recall seeing people in tears, you know, and hearing stories about people leaving in tears. Like sometimes, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe you need to see a therapist or something, but um, he was, he would not, he would not mince words. He told you exactly what he saw, what he heard. And the goal was always to help you surmount that, that issue and, and get better. You know. That's right. Uh, and you, you, you used the perfect terminology, honest progress. Um, <laughs> to tears, this isn't one of the things I was going to say, but um, I had an oboe student once, and um, I always told him to soak their reeds, you know, because you know how quickly they dry out, especially mm-hmm. double reeds. And uh, she just came in for a lesson, and she played, and, and um, she had water. She had saliva or just, you know, the, the soaking water in her reed. And while she was playing, so, you know, you get the gargle sound. And I said, okay, just take the reed off and blow on both ends, get it out of there. And just from that, just from being embarrassed from that, which is a minor thing, and it's a, it's a younger student, you know, she started, you know, weeping in the lesson there. And I said, oh, you know, it's okay. I said, these things happen, you know. Um, but again, you know, with, uh, there's this, there's this uh, legendary story about, I think it's a trumpet player. It wasn't Bud Herseth may not have even been the Chicago Symphony, but very prominent conductor, could have been Carrion, was rehearsing something, some brass player fracked a note. And as soon as the conductor heard it, just, you know, kept going, doing what he was doing. But with his left hand, he did this. You know what that means? You have two weeks to find another job. <laughs> yeah, okay. But hey, if you're going to take an audition and play in a group of that stature and you're going to get paid, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, whatever it is a year. Yeah. You better not crack any nuts. Right. That's, a, um, that's a job and they have every right to have the standards that they want. And if they want to have extremely high standards, that's, that's their prerogative. You know, it doesn't have to be personal. I mean, I've had this talk huh? with, with um, students and, and fellow uh, players alike. Like um, it's, it's not it's it's not a moral failing when you make a mistake. It's it's a technical thing, um, and you if you want if you don't want to make the mistake again, you you simply work on the 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 technique and the programming so it's you know less probable that that happens again. But yeah, the the auditions like you can't you can't be overly sensitive about that kind of stuff. Like they want what they want. If you if you can't play to the level that they want. And you want those kind of jobs, you got to work and, and get to that level, or you think about something else to do, you know. Um, but it's, yeah, the, this this growing mentality, people are feel like they're owed something for, for a particular career or that uh, that these are somehow like moral slights when, when you don't, when you don't win, win a job or, or uh, even, a, you know, teachers correcting you, like, just relax a little bit. Um, you, you can, you can get better at something and not feel like somebody's trying to break your heart. (laughs) Completely agreed. And I've had this, I've discussed this topic, not with you. So I'm glad we're discussing it now. Um, my brother has this phrase, 
where did we go wrong? Meaning, um, and I'm talking about, and I just had an experience yesterday on Facebook about marketing my arrangements, merely telling people where they could find them in a particular group. Mm -hmm. And some people in that group didn't like it. They just thought it was for self-promotion, self-gain. But, you know, I don't make a mint on these, you know, on that work. Just merely trying to tell people where they can get it because it was, it was a link posted in a group that was connected to that particular band, the music of that particular band. So I just went through that yesterday and you know, um, let's, let's not dwell on this subject too long because we could go forever, but in the areas of uh, personal sensitivity, of politics, of teacher to student correctivity or criticism, where did we go wrong? It's, it's really gotten askew in the past um, and I, I'm not knocking the younger generation, but that's where it's coming from. Even adults, even people older than, than you and me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where that's coming from. It must be something in the water. Uh, I don't know if we're not getting enough uh, potassium in our diet. I don't know where Those it's coming chem from. chemtrails. <laughs> but we, we really need to put ourselves in check and just be like, okay, let's buck up a little bit. Mm. Let's grow a thicker skin and, you know, let's, let's move on. Wow. Um, so I'll try to go through these as, as quickly as possible. But um, again, these are just observations that I've had in my very, you know, what I call a short teaching career that will pick up again, not at the moment, but it will. Mm. Um, starting with me, and maybe you've seen this too, but uh, I really suggest to all teachers that as soon as we hear this, if we hear something wrong, something's probably wrong. It's the simplest way you could put it. When I began playing saxophone, I, you know, you read all the, see all the diagrams in the books and I started tonguing on the roof of my mouth. Here we go again with wishing we had glass cheeks, right? right. So instead of putting my tongue on the tip of the reed, I would be using my air and talk, 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 talk on the roof of my mouth. And my band director, it was a small Catholic school band, maybe 30 kids unbalanced, never said anything, never corrected it. Not until, and I did that for two to three years until I started taking lessons with Bob Frankich and doing the jazz stuff. We did a couple of uh, solo things, you know, he helped me with that and, and making sure I'm doing everything right. But he said, what's up with your tongue? How are you tongue? And I said, well, and I, first time I ever had to put something like that into words, I said, well, I'm you know, putting my tongue on the roof of my mouth. It's like, yeah, you got to touch it to the reed, you know? Okay. So did that feel weird? Yeah. Did I think I was going to get a splinter in my tongue from touching flesh to wood? No, but I think that's the fear that a lot of younger kids have. So we have to fix that right now, not three years from now. If you hear it, fix it now. Because the older we get, the worse the habits are to break. So that was first on my list that I want to say, because it dealt with me. Um, and, you know, it, it improves the sound so much more and your, your tongue can be more agile, the harder things that you have to play. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get my horn out, but with, with younger players, when they start, especially on clarinet with younger players, and this is again, playing in your own bubble sort of thing. If you think about it, like I said, the instrument is an extension of our inner instrument and our inner workings. I've seen so many clarinet players that are playing all the way in, okay? This is not a cosmetic thing. It's not about, oh, your embouchure must be this, your hand position must be this. As, as Greg and, and Eric said, don't break what doesn't, or don't fix what isn't already broken. So if, if somebody right. has, you know, a, a hand position that works, it may not look great, but if it works for them, okay. But having the angle, having it so far in, you have to think about it this way. Our air supply is coming from, from our lungs up here, obviously, through here. It's already bending a curve right here, right? Coming out of our, coming into our mouth. And when that air stream, it has to, has to go directly down into a, that small little space with the reed in the mouthpiece, because your horn is so far in, it's got a very chintzy tone. Let's not underestimate the age of the student. 
Doesn't matter if they're 10 years old in fifth grade, 11 years old in sixth grade. Don't underestimate their, to oh, they don't need a good tone yet because they're not old enough. You don't know how far this child's going to go. Fix it now. Yeah. Take the horn. And I, you know, they're, they're, you know, we're not supposed to have, you know, hand contact with them. So touch them, but you can touch their instrument. So I take the bell of their clarinet as they're playing. I'm like, take a nice, good breath. Play me a, play me a long, play me a low C or whatever for as long as you can. Not a lot of air. Just want to hear your sound. And I would take their horn and I bring it out and be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my hands tired. Yes. Okay. Now you need to get a thummies. And this is, this is a thing with clarinet players. You cannot have this much thumb surpassing your thummies because that will ruin this front dexterity. I don't care who you are or how long you've been playing. It happens. And if you're going to get hand cramps from that, you've got to bring that thumb and your nail has to be directly flush underneath that thumb rest. Now you've got the dexterity here, but that's a different point. And, it's, and I said, listen to how this sound changes as I move your instrument. So it goes from this chintzy, very thin tone, because we have fixed that airstream to now go directly down in the instrument. You don't have to be already Shaw, you know, <laughs> but to have it far off and now far out enough that you're not interrupting that airstream. Think about water coming through a garden hose. If the garden hose isn't kinked, the water is going to flow and spit out the end. Now, if you take that garden hose and go, you're going to stop the water. When you have your horn like this, that's what you're doing because the air has to do some, it's like that Seinfeld story about the spit go in different directions. You're, you're, you're already kinking that airstream by, by forcing it to go down and they squeak all the time. Well, that's exactly where that comes from. So um, fix that, you know, as, as soon as you can. Another personal story I had, and this is on the brass side, had a, I did a substitute lesson once with a tuba player, sixth grade tuba player. His teacher was gone for the week. I had to do his lesson. And so we're playing his exercises out of the books and he was making this really interesting, interesting separation with his, between his notes, with his, with his airs, just playing quarter notes. And I'm thinking, you know, I want to look at him and figure out, you know, how he's doing this, but I'm going to use my ears first. So I finally look over at him and I said, how are you, how are you doing that? And he couldn't, you know, he couldn't put it into words. He couldn't describe, but to me, and pardon my terminology, please, it sounded like a muffled fart on a tuba. Whoop, 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 whoop. I'm like, I'm, I really got to get to the bottom of this. And it turns out inside the cup of the mouthpiece, as he was buzzing, he was kind of, he was letting the air out kind of like kissing inside the mouthpiece, like, mwah, mwah, Oh, separating, mwah. separating and that's how he, the air with his actual lips. Hmm. And so the other, his primary teacher heard that week after week, never fixed it. Hmm. So again, if we hear something wrong, we know something's wrong. So let's fix it. Um, I may have told you this next one. And this just is really a comprehension thing. It's not a, uh, it's not really in playing ability, but it can screw up your playing ability. This was at a clarinet fest that, uh, that was at NIU that I was conducting. And I don't know if you were there that particular year, but uh, we were doing my arrangement of Granger's Colonial Song. Um, and it was in, you know, that's a nice slow lush piece. And, and, uh, I did it in the original key. I'm a purist that way. And it was in, uh, it was an E. So all the B flat people were in F sharp. So okay. she's got, six, this is a, sorry, that, so it's coming in. Yeah. Everyone needs to know their keys, right? Oh, we'll practice, get to that. Practice, <laughs> practice your keys. Oh. Um, Sorry, continue. And I, I, I've developed a more practical approach on that. Now I'll, I'll come to that in a, in a bit. But um, she played contrabass, and it's not a very active part. Again, it's a slow piece. So we we're, we finished rehearsing, and then we went for a break. And I'm walking off the stage, and she stops me. She was on the end, and uh, she said, "I have a question about my part here, or whatever." And I said, "Okay." So I'm looking at it now. Key of F sharp, six sharps. Everything is sharp, but B. She had taken red pen 
and she had written in all the enharmonic equivalent flat names. So if her first and last note was an F sharp, three ledger lines below the staff, she wrote G flat above the note. I still can't figure out why she had to do that, but she did it for every single note and put the enharmonic equivalent. So if it was a C sharp, she put a D flat. If it was a G sharp, she put an A flat. I still haven't gotten to the bottom of that one. But I, what, could it, what, it, what it could have been is that, and this is an older woman, probably between 50 and 60. How are we teaching basic theory? It comes in the books, but, and this is a very, very bold statement to make, and I'm skipping around on my list, but I'll, since I brought myself there, I'll say it now. Um, there's only one other person I've ever encountered that has done the same as me, and it's actually a mutual colleague of ours. Um, when we first got our method books, very first ones, first weeks we had our instruments. Where is the fingering chart usually in a method book? Um, the full one. I've to seen the back. Yeah, in the back. So I get this instrument out. I'm like, wow, saxophone. There's a lot of key, 30 some keys on a saxophone. I'm like, oh, there's a lot of keys on. I wonder what they all do. General curiosity. So the first, I didn't play what was in the front of the book. I went home and I remember I, I put my book on the stand, the wire stand that never stays open, you know, right. and, and I put, I put the horn together and okay. So I'm looking at the diagram, you know, day one, I'm like, bit, 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 pinkies, 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 played a low B flat. I went through the whole range of the horn. Didn't sound great, of course, but went through the whole range of the horn. I'm like, cause this is so cool. Okay. This note, this printed thing corresponds with this combination of fingers. And I basically went up chromatically. Again, didn't sound wonderful. I thought it did. And I really feel that we are not, that that system, that teaching system really needs a revision. We've been doing it so long for so many years. It doesn't have to be completely revolutionized, but I'm sure you've seen this too. It's a big culture shock when a student of say beginning or mid high school gets put, let's talk, uh, let's talk clarinet or let's talk flute. There's so much and the publishers are, are the people that are doing this because they're set in their ways. Again, another bold statement, but the more people I talk to, to this about, they're aware of it, but nobody says it out loud. I'm sick of the key of B flat. Even these overtures that come out by new uh, composers, you know, commissions every year, whatever festivals. I'm sick of the key of B flat. You go outside, we have green trees, we have green grass, we have green shrubs, everything's green. Okay. It would be, it's kind of like what Ned Flanders once said on the Simpsons when he went to Vegas. It's all in, it's designed to inflame the senses. So if we had like, you know, uh, patches of pink, you know, fluorescent pink grass and orange trees and, you know, blue pavement and all that, it would be a whole lot more colorful. Whenever I hear the key of B flat at the beginning, big, beginning of an overture, but uh, it's just like, I hear that first B flat chord and my head goes in my hands. It's like, okay, can we pick another key now? Right. Because that's, we're so trained in that. I understand it's the open brass system on uh, the open system on all the brass instruments. It's the most resonant. It's the most overtones. Okay. That's great. But, you know, as a, an acquaintance of mine once said, a bassoon player, you paid for all the keys on your instrument, so you might as well use them. 300 years ago, we had, you know, pipe instruments that were only diatonic. Now they've been made chromatic. But now people freak out when they see more than two flats or, two or three flats or three sharps. And I say nuts to that. Those keys exist for a reason. Composers wrote in those keys for a reason. Why are we only using, we're, we're, we're uh, pigeonholing ourselves with band keys, orchestra keys, clarinet keys. You know, it really shouldn't matter. A key is a key is a key. Right. 
again, publishers are the biggest victims. And I've researched publishers before I got published and they have other, those were other restrictions just because they're not looking for anybody new, but I have a huge thing with that. Um, anyway, getting back to the method books and, and all of that. Yeah. Young band music is we've got to have a standard. We got to make them get used to B flat on a flute, E flat on a flute, thumb F for clarinet, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, like long C once we get there for, for clarinet, you know, concert B flat. And, but again, once we get a, something like if we get an overture handed to us, that's in the key of C real C that is, I don't like to use the term. I'm not a fan of the, I know this sounds weird to most, but I'm not a fan of the term concert pitch because mm -hmm. you can have pitch outside of a concert. Yeah. You know, um, I use the term real pitch cause that's what it is. Concert pitch, it just sounds too, it just sounds too odd to me. So, but that's me. Um, you give that overture to people in the key of C. Oh my God. You know, I'm not making fun of a, of a high school student's mind, but you give it to a high school flute player. They don't have any flats. Oh my God. I never knew that B natural ever existed. Well, <laughs> that is because you have not been exposed to it early on in middle school. I think the chromatic scale should be introduced on page five instead of page 55. Um, and not the whole thing, little sections, B flat, B natural, C, just a little section of it. Later on down the road, C, C sharp, D. And then we could play a one octave scale from B flat to B flat, the whole band combined to get that concept in ingrained in our heads because I still know adults that have comprehension problems with enharmonics. People still freak out about F flats and C flats. They can't jump off the page and bite you. They're used there for a reason. And I'm not an, you know, an expert theorist or an expert arranger, but in arranging, a lot of the arranging that I've done, they, you know, cosmetic reading you'd never put like when you when you spell a triad you know in bad publications you will see this but you never spell a um you know an, an e flat major triad with an e flat a g and an a sharp you'd never do that yeah, right you know but seeing you know if you had some kind of weird thing where you had like e flat or i'm sorry e natural next to e flat and you had 16th notes you know natural flat and da 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 who wants to see natural flat, natural flat, natural flat, natural flat? That's why we use F flat. But people would rather complain about it than embrace what it, what the real use of it is for. You know, it may, yeah, it may be oddball. No, you won't see it every day. But this brings me to another point of you play an instrument. You are responsible for everything. You have to know your key. You have to know your rhythm. You should never have to raise your hand. High school students, middle school students, sure. But when you have to even take a moment to think about, unless it's poorly written, and some things are poorly written, shouldn't have to think about it. It's our job to know that off the bat because we're, we're paid to be multitaskers. I think, I think you narrowed, narrowed down some of the, the broader issues we've been talking about right there. The um, oversensitivity and the responsibility uh, those are things that I feel like escape, you know, they escape students, escape certain teachers. Um, but it, it seems to me like it, all those issues narrow down to those, um, or a lot of them narrow down to those two issues of being overly sensitive or having a lack of responsibility over what you're doing. Um, I know like, um, uh, so you're right you're right and another another thing that that plays into this that that can become a bad thing it's not a bad thing overall but it can become a bad thing if you enable it and that is crutches um we've all seen pieces of parts in front of us that have been used by classes before us or different groups and the thing is marked up to the dickens with eyeglasses and circles and x outs and you know watch here and you know um, all of that stuff needs to go in one place only. Quite honestly, another bold statement, 
but I truly believe in it, and this is why I'm saying it out loud. Circling a key signature on your part, it ain't going to help you. You're not doing anything helpful. If you, don't um, have, uh, if you don't have the forethought to look at it in the first place, uh, perhaps the circling is uh, not doing as much. Right, and, and it's, really, it's really getting back to fundamentals, and not just fundamentals in physical playing, but fundamentals in, in theory education. And I could go into the subject of, I feel that music cl- general music class needs to be put into school curriculums. Because let's face it, there's a lot of things we all have to learn in school that we're not using now as adults. So let me take you through this one. It's just as important because people can use music by reading it in church or, you know, we're not going to, it's not like you're going to be a 35 year old engineer and decide to sit one, sit down one night after dinner and analyze the chord structure of joy to the world. No, you know, no, I'm not saying that, but just as general knowledge, we go through 12 years of learning science of all kinds, botany, physiology, geology, but we all don't become scientists. You spend 12 years in basic education in English class and literature and learning how to diagram sentence. Have you diagrammed a sentence since you left eighth grade? Not until gen eds made me do it in college. (laughs) Um, Same thing with math, same thing with social studies. Um, I think a real problem in most instrumentalists, and it's not their fault, it's curriculum's fault, is that we have to not only learn how to play and control this instrument, but we also have to learn the language at the same time. It's a lot of cognitive stuff going on. And this is what I have against crutches. The same teacher that I had subbed for, the story about the the tuba student. Mm -hmm. Um, I also had to sub for a duo trombone uh, lesson. And one of these students had the position numbers written in above every note. So if you're putting a one above an F, what happens if a B flat comes out on a trombone? Because that's going to happen. So really what ends up happening is the student becomes so clutched to their numbers, they're reading the numbers above the staff. They're not reading what's in the staff. That can become a problem because Teachers don't say, and some days there was one lesson I just got so fed up with a student because the markings, there was more pencil graphite on the page than there was printed ink. And I went to the library and I pulled out a fresh copy of the part and I took their part and I dramatically went over to the waste can and went, said, you're never going to see that again. So we're starting fresh. All your notes are gone. You need to, everything you need to do, I'll say this slowly and surely, everything you need to do is on the page already. Um, ILMEA scales are, are good. Uh, the Peoria people are going to come after me now. They're good, and they integrate the minors coming down and, you know, works out. So do we make it through the whole circle of fifths? No. So what, what I think should really be in uh, intermediate method books is spider, what, what some people know as spider scales. Start on the lowest note possible on your instrument, play that major scale. So for clarinet, we're going to start on E, play E major. It's kind of a bear to start there because we've got four sharps. But when, you th- when we think about it, and a lot of people will, will get this, playing is very uh, muscle memory, right? Mm-hmm. E, okay, you, don't, we, you and I don't need to have an E major scale in front of us. We can actually close our eyes and visualize it on a staff. Uh, da, 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 da. You know, we, it's a feel thing. We can play without in our sleep. So are you familiar with spider scales, what I'm talking about? Um, probably. I don't know if I've heard it put that way, but just go ahead. But you're, you're, you're going through all the keys, right. you know, uh, semi-chromatically on your instrument. So low E, ba 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 oh, sorry, ba da 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 ba, uh, F on down, ba 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 yep, yep. F sharp on the way up, G on the way down. Mm-hmm. That's how ILMEA scale should be. But, you know, the minors are not, not important. But you know what I mean? Um, right. We don't have time to do both. So 
Do I, I think those need to be rewritten? Yeah. Um, and you know, it's applying key signatures. Here's another thing. It's been a secret of mine for a long time, but I'm like, okay, how can I counteract this key problem and make instrumentalists play comfortably in, you know, hefty keys? I thought I need a simple tune, a well-known tune that is melodic, it's sequential, and it's got a couple of accidentals in it just to throw you. Do, re, mi. So I went to my Pro Tools. I, well, first I went to Finale and put it all in, did all 12 keys, and I had the solo line and piano accompaniment, went to my Pro Tools, recorded all the piano accompaniments, as, so it sounds like a real person and not MIDI, in all 12 keys, stored that as MP3s, put them on my iPod. Then now my students come in, week one, you're going to play it in your key of C, not transposing keys. So a clarinet person will come in, play it in C, which is real B flat, and take them through their proper circle of fits. The next week, they have to be able to play it in G, next week D, next week A. Same melody, of course, it's going to be in a different register, but with a familiar tune that's comfortable. And let me tell you something, it's possible. Is it awkward? Do we see them every day? No. Is it impossible? No. It is possible. We're just afraid of them. I don't know why. Um, yeah. par again, partially because pub publishers, and this is a thing that really, it's Peter Griffin coming on here. You know what really grinds my gears? Um, Publishers will take, uh, this is a bad example, Festive Overture, which is originally in. God. Shostakovich. Oh. It's originally in A. Oh. Uh, for orchestra, and it's a very bright key. It's just, it just sings in that key, right? Hunsberger writes the band arrangement of it and puts it in A flat. Does it make it more motor, you know, better for your motor skills on? Yeah, it does. I'll admit that. But when that's done, you're just kind of taking, you know, very bright piece, very, you know, for lack of a better term for this festive piece, and you bring it down a half step and it's just kind of like, you know, letting the air out of a balloon. Yeah. You know, and you, you take the spirit out, you deflate it a little bit. And people still don't understand why I think that way. But I guarantee you, the more people you ask, they will agree. All right. Oh, well, people don't know what the original key is. Yeah, but still, it would be better where yeah. it's supposed to be. There's, um, there's a, it seems like there's an assumption that, like, the mel just the melody, regardless of, of the key, is, is what makes the music important somehow. Like, no, the... The melody is certainly important, but the composer put it in that key for a reason. That's part of the the overall character of the music. Uh, when it's modified, when it's modified for uh, this is my my view here, but yeah, when it's modified in any way, in that way, um, it it loses something. It becomes something different. It may be good or not, but it's now it's different from what it was. You know, it's uh, I think. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know, you've done some arrangements for me in the past. Um, I feel like, you know, the maintaining that original key uh, for you know across instruments. Like, I I want to I want to keep at least for what I, I think I've sent you before. Like, I want to keep the quality, the you know the the certain character and quality, but um, as as played by different instruments. You know. Yeah, um, and I. I completely agree. And I, I never underestimate the, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to find the right word here. I never underestimate the, um, for lack of a better word, understanding of a student or an audience member in, and they could be the most uneducated, musically uneducated audience member. So when they go and, um, hear a, a band arrangement of Sir Duke, Stevie Wonder, that's in B major, B bum 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 bum, and it's that's a very bright key, sharp keys, bright keys, whatever. And you know he put it there for a reason. It might have been a vocal reason, 
but you know, when you, and everybody's heard that tune on the radio. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get kind of deep and I'm no psychologist at all, but I think about, you know, you know how a person hears a song from, you know, a 50 year old person now hears a song from the seventies. Oh, I haven't heard that since I was a kid. You know, it brings them back to like, you know, the clothes they wore and the people they hung out with and places they, places they hung out at. That's what music can do for us. Right. And we all have those moments. So they heard that song. I would guess you classify it as Motown soul. They heard that song when it first came out on the radio and that they only heard it one way. And that one way is way deep on the underside of their brain and their subconscious. Now they go to a concert and they go to a, they go to a band concert and hear a band arrangement of it. What's going to happen. It's not going to be in B it's going to be in B flat. They're going to drop it. Right. Just to put it in B flat. And I really feel that the most uneducated music person or audience member is listening to it's like, yeah, okay, well, it's being played by a concert band. You know, it's not a pop group like Stevie Wonder, but some something wrong about it. I can't put my finger on it because they lowered the damn key, <laughs> you know? Um, and okay, so now being in the publisher world, the, re the, 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 the way that I got in, well, first I'll say the reason I stayed out. The reason I stayed out is because I'm, I'm a real stickler about how music is printed. We've all seen like the, the, the quarter size sheets of marches and all that. And they use like yeah. the repeat uh, measure signs. I despise those things. I absolutely hate them. I think they cause more confusion than good. They're just saving space. Publishers only care about three things, ink, space, and paper. They don't care about how the layout looks or how, easily readable or non easily re readable it is for the player they're just trying to fit it on two pages and that's it right um that's yeah you're shaking your head it's not a good thing and the again the more people i talk to the more they say yeah this the look of this really stinks i'll say too uh i mean people people have had probably had their own experience with this but often if i'm buying music sheet music and uh, I have the choice between different editions. I'll go with the one that I, has a reputation of being easier easier to look at and easier to work with. You know, like things like, uh, you know, I, I've gotten like Urtex and Baron Ryder, like where it's, I, I know what I'm looking at uh, in, and like uh, on the other side of that, my experience with orchestral music um, let's say music from, from certain libraries is much harder to deal with and more often has mistakes or illegible printing. Um, and it's, it's much less joyful to, <laughs> to work. Uh, I mean, and the music might be amazing, but you know, um, it's, it, it's the, the, the dinner served on a trash, trash can lid versus a, yeah, um, Publishers, you know, people who are actually doing the layout, they are probably a player. They're probably a musician. But, you know, think about it. We've got enough to worry about mentally mm -hmm. with here, with watching, with listening, with everything else. We do not need to be, you know, like, I don't know how the people back in Hollywood, like 50 years ago before, you know, when everything was done with music typewriter or, or manuscript. And let me say right? Yes. Um, how they did it. I just don't know. Um, and I'll, I'll both again, I'll boldly say if you don't have good manuscript, don't write it out. Hire a copyist, call me, you know, uh, it's just, we, we don't want to have to put our players through that. I mean, I, you right. try, yeah, I know, but you know, if it's, you know, I'm sure you have seen some really horrendous manuscript, um, and people who don't have good manuscripts, some people have, fantastic manuscript um i used to do everything manuscript and then of course you know your hand cramps up and you need to buy have a new hand sewn to your arm um used rulers and all that because i i knew how important that was to make it look good um but i as far as cosmetics with music yeah stuff like that it's just like um you know there are certain things i do not use mm -hmm. i will never use those measure repeat symbols i will ne i never use dim or cresc well yeah. the reason is the reason is is because we have a starting dynamic and then we have the, the ending dynamic is somewhere we haven't seen it yet 
Opa and you have Dim, or let's say you have Kresk, well, I don't know how long I'm Kresking for. I would rather see the hairpin because that shows me how long I'm supposed to do it. It could be a 12 bar crescendo, which is very long. So let's do that. You know why? Because it takes more ink. Yeah. So um, that is why I've stayed away from publishers because they, I just, I know it sounds elitist, but I just can't put it any other way. You're not playing the music. You're only printing it. You're not going through, you're not seeing what we're seeing. You just care about your format. I care about format as well. And if you notice uh, with the, with the one um, Scriabin etude that I, which will by, by the way, be published tomorrow. <laughs> so I'll send you, I'll send you that link. Um, as I told you, it was coming up soon. Um, I really feel that it makes players, players can comprehend their phrases much better if you put four bars on a line. I've known other copyists that have done this, so it's not really a secret, but I hold to that like the Ten Commandments, man. Four bars to a line all the time. Mm. Every time. And I put all of my rehearsal, anybody who has seen my parts of any kind, all my rehearsal numbers are at the extreme left of a line, unless there's a bunch of multi-measure rests, and then I will save space. But you can all you always know where to find them. You're not looking for where's 35. You're not looking you're number 235. You're not, you know, you don't have to search for it. Boom, 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 all down the left. Um, because our music is in phrases, not the not the minimalist music and stuff of today, but you know, a big portion of all the older classic stuff, it's all in phrases. So we can put a half phrase on a line, put the next, put the subsequent phrase on the next line. It's so easy, but publishers just don't want to do that. They just think about <laughs> Um, now that I hear you say that, that makes a lot of a lot of sense, and I can think back to a lot of um, a lot of experiences where I've had to, I've had to make extra, you know, crutch notation to uh, to just help me help myself remember my ideas of the phrasing because of the way the the music is on the page because you know, it's um, like different uh, different lines are split up different. It sounds crazy. It's uh, about form because form is, you know, it, it's a, I guess you could say it's a natural uh, evolutionized thing in music, you know, A, B, B1, bridge, whatever, right. especially in pop music. Um, and I, again, the more people I ask, because I always thought, you know, I'm having all these individual crazy thoughts. So I started branching out and asking people and they say, yeah, you know, I don't understand why it's done this way. Um, again, saving ink, space, and paper. I absolutely despise. I hated them since day one, since my first, <laughs> you, you, for when you first learn about them in method books, first and second endings and repeat signs and DSs and codas and dull signos mm -hmm. and this and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we shouldn't have to read music like, because that's what we're doing. Why can't we just go from here to here? Why can't we do that? Um, ink, space, and paper. But now with the with everybody putting their music on these you know i stopped using paper 12 years ago oh wow and everything i play is is on this or actually the bigger one i'm using now for uh for our conference but um it's so much easier you tap the page there it is you can annotate it you can do all that you can erase stuff you can block it out but um you know again why do we have to you know play with a road map when it can be just written out. All of my rock arrangements or transcriptions have uh, none of them. Not one of them has a repeat hmm. in there or a first and second ending because there's always something slightly different in the second verse or the second chorus. But what I do do is usually A is verse one. I don't just put A. I put A. And then verse one, B is usually eight bars in C is chorus one. And I'll put C and outside that box, chorus one, it's all written out, but you know what? The, again, the more people that I talk to, they, they actually prefer that. Um, because, you know, the, uh, pop music, again, they're trying to save space. If you buy a, a sheet music single, you know, of say like Pharrell Williams, happy, um, they're going to put, you know, verse one and they're going to put first and second ending. And again, it's a, it's a visual jump thing, which a lot of people don't like, but it just takes someone to call up the publisher and say, people don't like this. Can you stop that? Um, 
but they won't because of ink, space, and paper. Okay. And, uh, but you know, so can we get away from it? Not really, but you know, with, with the advent and we're still in the advent of these, kind of like the mail. <laughs> How long are we gonna be dealing with mail before it goes away? Right. Newspapers are already going away. Mail, printed music, it'll be after you and I are, have left this planet, of course. But uh, yeah, I want to go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to go to Neptune, but I don't want to see blank, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's there, nothing is ever going to be ideal, uh, right. you know, with that. But I really feel that I really feel strongly, especially being an arranger, that. Uh, make it easy to read. Make it make it as yeah. easy to do one time. Some things may be rhythmically difficult or key, yeah. But you know, visually, you should not have a problem, and you shouldn't have to do any over processing with that. I, so um, that's where I am with that. I'm, I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're talking about this because, again, this is one of those things that you, you mentioned throughout uh, the 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 sense that you're the only one having these thoughts until until you talk to other professionals about it i think uh, and this is part of the value i wanted to share too is i'm sure if if you and i are are thinking about things like this there's got to be more people out there who once they hear it and it gets to put in the words like oh okay yeah th that makes sense and i think potentially that can affect the market of what comes forward because now people are people are voicing their thoughts, their preferences on what they're reading and what they're playing off of. And, you know, who knows where, where that could go. Um, to, to, to branch onto that, uh, again, what kept me away, people were telling me for years, I was writing band arrangements, I was writing this, these are so good, you should be published. Well, that's why I stayed away. And you're not, I mean, you can't bypass editors. If I hand them a band, you know, an arrangement of Sir Duke in B, the first third thing they're going to do to tick me off is put it in B flat. No, I don't want you to do that. Uh, well, this rhythm is too hard. You know, these 16th rhythms. No, that's the whole life of the tune. If you water down that rhythm, that's fine if you want to make a young band, like a grade one arrangement, but let somebody else do it. Let them do it. I won't. I certainly won't do that. Um, because I, I feel that you're really getting into the desecration. Yeah, it's a different thing about making it a young band arrangement so they can play it. But it's complicatingly different yeah. when you change it that way. But when you change it for, you know, um, you know, people want to hear it the way they know it. And the way they know it is the, the way they heard it on the radio all and through all these years. Right. Um, I, so the pub, the publisher that I'm at now, well, first of all, I called, this is about a year ago this time. I've been published for about a year. And, uh, when I started getting into it, I knew I would need a ton of time in order, I'm sorry, to, in order to, uh, to prepare everything. And uh, I called, I must have called 12. And not only did they take uh, one particular company, I won't say out loud, took six months to get back to me. Mm. And they said, um, yeah, we looked at your submission. We're not looking for this type of thing at this it was a concert band arrangement with a, with a soloist and i sent them a recording it was actually something i had performed at midwest a couple years ago oh and so it was out there right uh but listed as manuscript and sorry we're not looking for this but this company got back to me six months later and i replied to that company and i said i wouldn't go with you anyway because it took you six months to reply to me you can't be that busy that it took you six months to. i mean that's bad business um, so that one's off the shelf, but everybody else was saying, okay, well, we only do, we're only looking for jazz band at this time. We're only looking for chamber music. We're only looking for, uh, zither trio. We're only looking for a uh, hurdy gurdy quartet, you know? So, and that's fine because they've got their stock. They've got their core of people. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just not going to fire them off. Like somebody, the occupant of the white house does, but, um, so everybody set, and that's that's cool. That's that's where it is. Uh, very few people. Jim Stevenson, uh, who's up in the northern suburbs, just got published with Hal Leonard. He writes good stuff, rightfully so. He you know he seeped in because they wanted him, um, and plus they have to still produce all of the older things. So with my publisher with Sheet Music Plus, which you have to be included in, I went to them first, 
And at this point, I'll say it's taken me 11 years to transcribe. I wanted to do one core of work from somebody. And Chicago is my favorite band. It has been since I was a kid. So in 2009, I started transcribing every song from every album in full score. Hmm. Beginning to end, all solos, all horn breaks, all background vocals, everything. A lot of people say it's a moot point because, oh, well, they produced sketch, uh, sketch scores so many years ago. Well, that's exactly what they are, is condensed scores. They don't show you everything. They don't show you drum solos. They don't show you guitar solos. They don't have the horn voicing spelled out correctly. So I'm not copying what has been done. I'm doing something in a different format, and it's all spelled out with a set of parts which is odd for a rock band to do that. But, you know, the more rock, the more you scrounge around on, on Facebook and looking at all these groups, yeah, groups can memorize stuff, but you're also seeing them with little iPads on stands. And, the, you know, it could be a guitar player reading changes. It could be a vocalist needing the, the, uh, the, the lyrics in front of them. Whatever it is, they're reading on iPads, which is exactly the format that I'm providing it in because it's a digital download. So it took me 11 years to transcribe all of the Chicago albums um, and mixed in my library is chamber music, clarinet choir, saxophone choir, saxophone quartet, clarinet quartet, string quartet. Um, I've got some vocal pieces up there, uh, some TV themes because I'm a sucker for novelty music. <laughs> and uh, so I've got about 300, uh, over 330 titles up there now. I have sold in 16 foreign countries. I just had a sale in Norway just last night or in the middle of the night. And I've overall, I've had like a little over 200 sales in a year. So things aren't flying off the shelves, but again, I do very specific stuff. Uh, the only problem with my publisher right now is that they are not, uh, Sheet Music Plus is owned by Hal Leonard. So ha Hal Leonard has Sheet Music Plus online. Mm. Um, so everything that Hal Leonard has the rights to Sheet Music Plus also has the rights to. So I can't make an arrangement unless Hal Leonard slash Sheet Music Plus holds those those copyrights. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it can't be it can't be put up. And the and the the profit doesn't go to the right person. So the other thing that's that's that they don't have set up yet, they will, but they don't now, is large ensembles. So anything for orchestra, and I've written over probably a hundred Pops Orchestra works. Um, and for concert band and marching band, they allow jazz band, but they don't allow marching band or, you know, concert band. Okay. So, um, that will, I'm told that will be coming later. It's not in the works right now, but the day that that comes, I mean, I've got dozens of orchestral pop tunes to put up there, um, or to send in rather. So, uh, that is where we're at. And the beautiful thing about it, I don't have to deal with editors. And I will say it's honest and everybody knows this. You've, you've, people have ordered things off of Sheet Music Plus in the format that they need, but you know, they're, they're kind of amateur people and the cosmetically, it just doesn't look very good or the arrangement quality just isn't that good. Um, I've run into that as well. I ran into it years ago when I'd buy things for my vocal students. So, um, and everybody, you know, everybody knows that, but, uh, but that's the problem of not going through editors is that you get product like that. But for me, you know, I don't want them messing with my four bar format or my key or my rhythm or anything like that. What I do hits the pavement and it's not going to be changed. That's the beautiful thing about it. So, uh, and again, that's exactly what people want to hear um, and, and use those arrangements as they're meant to be done and not really altered that much. So, and every call I get, every commission I get, okay, I want to do this Streisand song. So I want to do it with orchestra and a, 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 uh, a tribute vocalist. I want it to sound exactly like the recording. So I've got to dub the song, put my headphones in, start transcribing as it's heard, because that's what that is what I am asked to do, because that is what the mass wants. That's and so they won't put it out. They won't put it out there. Um, it's a kind of a rabbit trail, but uh, I feel like we've been dipping into it a little bit. Um, what are some for your for your arranging work and all, all that? What are some uh, some of your favorite like tools, apps, uh, programs? What are what are the kinds of things you use to to do that work and and uh, things you prefer? 
that I mean, it seems like seems like uh, if somebody's interested in getting into it, there might be a lot of uh, say options out there, and uh, who knows what I mean. It's not something I deal with. You know, I just put the horn in my mouth and play what's put in front of me. But right. um, yeah, for for somebody who's in an alto clarinet part. <laughs> oh well, yeah. If I have one to play, let's say. Um, but yeah, if somebody's interested in getting into that, what are, what are some what are some of those resources you might uh, that you use or that you might recommend? I am glad you asked. Are you talking about equipment, though? Uh, it could be equipment. Could be could be the software side of things. Um, just um, uh, or you could just go through a general workflow and like what you pick up and what you do it on. You know. Um, I used to do. I used to get all my source materials from iTunes. And honestly, once an old laptop died and when Apple changed over their system with the iTunes, I never reinstalled iTunes. I still have my iPod and I still have my entire library. I'm just not using it anymore. Um, I may someday, but really, I mean, every source, unless they send me a separate, the client sends me uh, an MP3 or a wave, I'll get it from YouTube. Hmm. Um, I just, for a Pops Orchestra, uh, I've, I've arranged for the uh, Sarasota Pops in Florida for about seven years now. Oh. And they do a lot of theme concerts. So whenever I'm asked to, I'll, I'll do an entire concert. I'll have to do eight to 10 arrangements in one sitting. Um, people say arrangements, but they're really transcriptions because I'm taking down everything by ear from the recording. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's technical. Um, right now, what, simply what I'll do is I have a field recorder uh, that... Uh, you know, it's uh, the, the, it's a Sony unit that has the external microphones, but it also has the uh, quarter inch uh, input. And basically I'll just go to YouTube on my phone and get, uh, take the, the mail to mail eighth inch cable and put, this is why I don't want to get rid of this phone because it's got, it's got the, uh, the headphone yeah. jack on it exactly. to be able to put that in and then find the tune on YouTube, connect this to uh, my recorder and dub the tune in real time. And the beautiful thing about that recorder is, is that you can, um, it holds six hours of audio and it's got like 10 different folders on it. Only use one folder, but you can track. This is a beautiful thing when you're doing transcribing work. You know, back in the days of like reel to reels and cassettes, you had to stop, rewind, play, stop, rewind, play. And the great thing with this, with the flash memory is that once you get the whole tune on there, I save it as an entire tune as an MP3 as a backup, but I will, um, I'll cut it into four bar sections. So I'll let the tune play through a four, two, three, four, boom, hit the divide button. Mm -hmm. So now when it, it tracks it in four bar sections, which is much easier to work from when I'm listening. And cause I'm constantly one hands on the mouse, one hand is on the recorder, start play. And then I'm, you know, I'm mousing and clicking and whatever. Um, and, the, and so that's basically that I use finale. I always have. And, uh, some there's two different schools of thought. A lot of people think that Finale is just it's too many tools or it's too complicated. It's not very user friendly. Whereas the other side likes Sibelius a whole lot more. But you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, and I I basically and some people will play it in, but that really takes a whole lot more time and effort to have to play it on a MIDI keyboard because you have to get the line down in your head first. Then you got to hit record on the MIDI keyboard and play it in. Oh, no, I made a mistake. Now I got to do it again. For me, it's much easier to click every node value in, um, and I use shortcut keys on the keyboard, click every node value in on my mouse. And I have this one of those awesome mices that does not move. It's just got the thumb ball. Yeah. That, that you know, ball. And it's, when, I mean, when you're, when you're going around the staff and making those little movements, it's so much easier to do it with just your thumb and, you know, click with your forefinger. Um, so basically what I do is say if you got to go on the simple side, if you've got a, a, a rock tune, I just did a bunch of uh, sticks tunes for a friend of mine um, and just did uh, fooling yourself. That was one of them. And uh, usually what I'll do first is I'll map out the vocals I'll, I'll, and I'll have to do multiple passes through the tune. I'll map out the vocals first because that's going to show me how long the tune is going to be. 
and I'll put just the notes and rhythms of the vocal. Then I'll go back a second time and put in all the lyrics because you have to type in the lyrics. Then I will do the background vocals and get those out of the way and I will score them exactly the way they're heard. Um, then I will do the bass line because that's going to show me the rest of the harmonic foundation for the rest of the tune. So I'll do the bass line first. And uh, then I do the drum part. Drummers don't chastise me, but I get the noise out of the way. So, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a lot of cut and paste. I do write out all my drum parts. I leave no slash notation. I don't leave anything ambiguous. I spell each and everything out. Um, some drummers hate me for that and I won't go there, but it's a lot of cut and, cut and paste to do that. So it's a little easy. Auxiliary percussion will be next. Rhythm parts are difficult because I do write out exactly how they played it on the recording, being keyboard parts and guitar parts. I never use slash notation. I never use chord symbols. Uh, I'll say here that this is where we run into problems because, again, guitar players, I'm not condemning you, but uh, lots of guitar players, and they think they're fooling people and they're not with their reasoning, but they'll slap a capo on the instrument basically because they don't want to learn their chords and all their keys. They want to learn one set of chords and they'll put the capo on to shorten the instrument and you know do whatever well not all pieces of music have parenthesized chords above the staff that say capo two different chord they don't all have that um and if i for all the musicals i've directed again guitar players i'm not condemning you and you know it's true but for all the guitar players that i've hired that can't read music i wouldn't have any nickels right um you got to know how to read vocalists you've got to know how to read you're saving us all a whole bunch of time when we don't have to teach it to you by rote that's another topic maybe for another day but um really that's i, I have very strong standpoints on that as well but anyway um the rhythm parts for for transcribing are really time consuming because they're rhythm you know um I do exact guitar voicings the way that I hear them and I'll put in the exact rhythm because that's what people want to play. Why figure it out by ear and have to listen to it 79 times when you can, when I provide it for you right here in front of you. Right. Um, then if any horns are in there, I'll do that. And then the, the tune is done. I'll do, you know, cosmetic stuff with the score to make it look good. And then I'm done. Uh, if I have the time to do it like pandemic time, like we all do. Yes. Lots and lots of time. I can get I can get a rock tune done in two days if I'm sitting all day and doing it just because I've I've done it so much, yeah. um, and a lot of people think that might be weird to find music in that format because oh well we're used to seeing this and just a piano vocal for you know inviting in the store, you don't see much sheet music in the stores anymore and Sheet Music Plus has a lot of it. Uh, Hal Leonard is selling their own versions, but. Um, whether they be singles or in, you know, book collections. But I've never met a book collection that I ever liked, especially for Broadway. Um, I did a huge project on my own to collect all uh, uh, bootleg scores and uh, and songs because you wouldn't find them in the collection volumes. So anyway, that's that neither here nor there. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm really all about, in what I produce, making it easily readable, making it keeping it true to its original form, the, the thing that's everybody knows. There's no, there's no, nothing wrong in writing a new arrangement and, and putting a different spin on it. I had a uh, friend of mine from college who, who just did, um, he wrote his, his own Latin version of the Christmas song, Chestnuts. Hmm. Just put a Latin feel to it. It's not, uh, it's not um, standard. It's not the one everybody knows, but it's a cool flavor. So he wrote it for, jazz band and I think pep band and he asked me to blow it up for orchestra so I did that for the Kishwaukee Symphony Orchestra last Christmas uh, yeah. um, and it, it it it's it works you know some people say he eh, eh, shouldn't be a Latin yeah that's okay but um, is it different yeah but you know I'm all about you know keeping that because the, I mean you know there's some music that is absolutely timeless you know why do they why did they use Rhapsody in Blue for the old what was it America United Airlines commercials yeah or whatever it was um you know because it's just you know there is just absolutely Christmas if we talk about Christmas to write a new Christmas song for a pop artist to do that today you are competing with you don't know what you're up against because you can't beat winter wonderland 
jingle bells, yeah. chestnuts. You just can't beat them. You know, they have stood the test of time. Um, I'll say here, it's another bold statement, but again, lots of people see the, see it the same way. I think good pop music ended about 2000. There's very few that have broken through that have, that are really good. Ed Sheeran's thinking out loud, Pharrell Williams happy. Very few that have, that is good music. Yeah. EDM gonna, is its own thing. What's yeah. that? I was going to ask uh, if it, you know, like who, who would you, who would you consider good to pass that point? So it's, it's nice to hear a couple examples. Um, what, uh, is there something that would qualify uh, good versus not that you could put into words? Yeah, it's just that, um, and you know, the, pardon the term, the boomers of today, what they used to say about when rock and roll and, you know, the Elvis years that came out, um, they didn't like the break away from big band, which is what they grew up with, to what became popular music. And then the next generation into the 70s and disco and then, you know, synth pop in the 80s. Every decade has had its own thing. But what I'm talking about is quality. Bieber. Uh-uh. Only because it's basically a drone. It's, uh, it's all loops. It's all overproduced. Um, lyrics, not really meaningful. And again, it's a bold statement, but when you really sit and think about it, there isn't much to the quality of the music. Compare that to uh, Burt Bacharach to Doobie, even like Doobie Brothers, Billy Joel, Simon and Garfunkel. That was good music. And I mean, all the way back, all the jazz artists, I'll loop all those into one and, you know, all the way back to the big band era. But it's just too simplistic these days. I would rather watch paint dry than listen to that stuff. <laughs> it's just not, or I'd rather sit and contemplate my navel. One, one, one it, it i'd get more excitement out of that than listening to it just because it's you and i what we play and what we've heard in our lifetime but this is what they're this is what radio and spotify and everything else is pushing the younger generation to hear that's the way um the way you put that like um uh previous generations had to go through different gatekeepers to to have their art exposed to uh um, exposed to an audience uh, today you get the similar similar gatekeepers but what they're pushing is uh, you know what you were saying like less lesser quality um, I feel like though uh, at least from things I've seen online uh, more more artists who uh, who are kind of dispensing with the the traditional gatekeepers and just putting their stuff you know, on YouTube or whatever you know, like just whatever outlet like um you're uh, i think the quality that we're missing from the more mainstream uh music that's promoted is starting to emerge more and more from like the smaller creators that you, you, you kind of have to go find them um you know it's you're not gonna you're not gonna see them from a big not necessarily see them from a big producer but you know you you I, I know I've run into some um, more recently produced music that I think is, is interesting, fascinating. Um, but it's, it's always just some, you know, some people who decided they wanted to put it on YouTube or, or whatever. All right. I'll give you a, I'll give you a real life example. And, uh, and it, again, it's not about my taste. It's about, what happens when it gets out there? You know, like I said, what's being written and played and produced these days is very basic and simple. Like I, I actually had to do, somebody asked me to transcribe, uh, what do you mean, Justin Bieber? It's a lot of cut and paste. I just had to do like 16 bars and I went, pip, 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 pip. it's like, wow. You know, um, and to me, it's about, you know, what the way I was raised and my ethics and all that, it's about work ethic. And now these these uh, artists aren't even writing their own songs. Yeah. Just, just, you know, performers. 
it, yeah, it's just like you're they're getting a ghost person and they're yeah, they're they're staged. Again, that's a that's a bold statement to say, but it really is the truth. Um I was a I was a blues host. I had my own radio show in uh on WNIJ for well, I did I did two slots, but I, I was a host for um ten years. And lots of different labels some labels have survived from the past a you know long time um and did a mix of everything of all the new and then all of all the old king greats albert king Rita franklin ray charles uh uh robert johnson you know trying to pull from my memory here and you know there's you have a blues progression but there's been evolution in that and there's you know brian setzer is, is like a uh, one the fabulous thunderbirds is, is another modern day group Mm. so blues has evolved but then you get to these smaller artists and I, it's not that i didn't want to play them because because i was also the music supervisor and i had to review all of these new albums and then i had to report our choices to the promoters to say this is what we're going to play on the air and you had to abide by that mm. and you could break away a little bit but um because they want to know what was going to be airplay and you know, obviously you're going to pick the best tunes that just grab you right from the start, even ballads. But there are some of these guys that, you know, will go into a studio or make a CD and all 12 tracks are all slow. They're all in the key of E and they're all just a basic progression. And they basically all sound the same. It's like 12 pieces of lettuce between yeah. two pieces of bread. Mm -hmm. And I would never, I would never put that on the air. And believe it or not, I had conflict with the other two blues hosts. We had three shows and one host per show. With the other two blues hosts, they would constantly uh, not argue, but they const I constantly get backlash about, well, you know, this is their lifeblood and this is, I understand that part. But if you heard, if you are on the other side and you heard this, and you played too much of it in one sitting in a three hour show, would you keep the station on? Yeah. So, um, you know, you have to be versatile. You have to do different things. Look, look at the stuff that Leonard Bernstein wrote. I mean, he wrote orchestra, band, musicals. Love that guy and love his body of work because of what he did. Um, that's not to say I don't like other composers, but you know, in, in that realm, you really have to be choosy with what you do on the air because it's all about keeping your audience. That's basically, you know, now that I'm outside of it, I can say that, you know, keeping your audience attentive or as long as they can. So um, when you put bad music on the air, it's just like watching a bad TV show. If you don't find it funny, you're going to switch the station. It's exactly what happens. So we had a real different school of thought, uh, which is one of the reasons I left the radio station was because of that. Um, you know, I would say, okay, you guys got to play tracks one, three, five, and seven off of this new CD. And what do you think they would do? They would play two, four, six, and eight, which is not what I reported to the promoter. So now I look like an idiot. Well, that wasn't yeah. going to happen. So that's where we are with that. interesting the uh the shortcut on zoom for for pausing the recording is alt p which is definitely what i did water <laughs> all right um uh, let's see uh, we, we've jumped around quite a bit so far it's been it's been really valuable i think um kind of going back to I guess the performance world a bit. Um, who are who are some artists and what's some music that really really moves you, or uh, <clears throat> that you consider like a major influence to you? I know it's a big world to pick from. Yeah, I. Uh, it's not that I don't like the question, but you know the there are some people who can never narrow down right. a favorite. You know, favorite food, favorite color, whatever. Um, but for for 
reasons all in their in their own right uh, in in genre and people who perform in those genres. I like them all for different for different reasons. It's kind of like uh, I'm a Doctor Who fan, right? Uh, mostly classic Doctor Who from the 60s, 70s, 80s. And um, people say, who's your favorite doctor? I like them all for, you know, a different reason. Can't narrow it down to, to, to one. Um, I, I, I have a real soft spot for uh, musical theater. Musical theater is another thing that has uh, evolved a lot to today. And the, the, uh, the style of writing, the instrumentation in the pit, of course, and um, some of those changes I personally like, some I don't. Uh, and is, of course the style, but I have a real soft spot for the classic musicals, you know, the ones that everybody know. And um, there are some of those ballads, I mean, you know, some of those that have become jazz standards. Mm. Uh, it's hard to think of one now. Um, almost like being in love, let's say that one from Brigadoon, you know. And so many people have covered it. Uh, again, timeless music that is just the quality of it and just the, the lyrics, the meaning that's in the lyrics, the way it's written, it's just, you can't surpass that, you know. Um, in, the, in the classical music realm, there are just something, every time I play um, Firebird, the very end of Firebird, the big B major, you know, finale, I saw that live with CSO and Pierre Boulez. Mm. And I, my seats were behind in the row uh, underneath the order where the chorus sits. And uh, I was in college and I went with a couple people downtown to see that performance. And when sitting next to my friend, Dana, I'll never forget when I, uh, when I heard that performance and when I got to that, that big open section uh, and just the way he wrote it and uh, how he did it. I just, I, I remember I grabbed Dana's hand and I just went, Shh lost it you know it can just touch you in a way that can't put it into words um some pop music uh does that the same way and you know it's it's about the you know like i said earlier about you know hearing a song on the radio that you haven't heard in decades it brings back the feels right yeah um it can bring you back it can even bring back a, a, a smell you know like what your old house smelled like you know Stuff like that, um, intangible things that just uh, that just touch you that just touch you in a way. There are some concert band pieces like um, uh, um, again. It's, it's to, to answer this question is tough because you got to you know what they are, but you you have to pull it from memory. Um, one that really gets me is um, oh, band wise, uh, shoot, it's it's hard. It's really hard. Uh, I'll think of it. Uh, uh, it. It's in the background there. It, it'll come up here. It'll, it's buffering. It'll come up in a second. But I, I, I like the, I like all the genres for different reasons, just because of the way that they can just the way that they can touch you. Um, some people. Uh, one that's coming to mind right now is I did a transcription of uh, Doris Day's Toyland for orchestra. Mm. And wow, just how that, and I, I still, I scrounge for the information and I can't find it. I don't know who did that studio arrangement, the one that's so famous. Um, and honestly, I didn't, I never heard the, I probably heard the tune in the background and just never registered it. But once I grabbed it and, and had to transcribe it, it is such a sentimental and beautiful song. Um, another thing is, uh, uh, and this, this goes a little bit outside of music. But uh, for some reason, when I was a young kid, I was attached to the Wizard of Oz, you know, and I watched, I must have seen the, watched the Wizard of Oz 30 times and, you know, can almost recite the dialogue in my head from beginning to end. You know, that is good scoring. Mm. That is good scoring. Um, and it's, again, it's outside of music, but, you know, and I'm a sap, I'm a sentimental sap. The very last scene when Judy Garland says, there's no place like home, I lose it. Every single time. Willy Wonka, when they're in the Wonka Bader at the that is good scoring. Oh my God. You know. That's, that's funny. Um, I, I was just uh, I was just listening to the uh the, the Pure Imagination song uh, uh re earlier this week. I don't know why, just like 
it was in my head and I had to go look it up. And uh, once I heard it from, uh, I guess, from, from the Gene Wilder movie, like there was something uh, um, like, like that kind of eerie, but um, a kind of, you know, sensational, uh, like imagination type, uh, like it feels like imagination. The song, like the song, <laughs> it's it feels like what it is. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the eerie part is what stuck out to me uh, revisiting it because um, there's, at the beginning, there's this kind of like, like, uh, like, like the the drone, uh, the high pitched drone from Psycho, but it's just like lingering in the back as he starts to sing, and then it kind of opens up into this like playful childhood feeling. It's like, but at first, like, what's going on? It's it's a little scary. Um, I don't know. It was endearing to me, but. Um, which which centered around the character that he played. You know, you never know, you never knew what was coming next if you've seen it for the first time. Um, and, you know, again, going back to like what, what we were talking about pop music earlier, uh, I wish, this is a thing I just wish didn't change. You take those movies, you take Willy Wonka, you take Indiana Jones. When is the last time you saw a current movie modern day movie that has a live orchestra it depends on the type of story of course you know mm. um it's a mad 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 world if you've never seen that movie and for anybody who's watching i highly recommend you see it because it's not only is it hilarious of the cast of that day it may be 50 years old but and the music behind it, oh my god just fabulous work just mm. incredible um, characteristic music, like Leroy Anderson, you know, he's not regarded as a push off. He was like the only guy who did lighthearted novelty music like that. I really feel this brings me to something else I wanted to, to plug. Um, you don't hear that anymore. And when's the last time you saw a movie that has that quality of music that I'm, I'm afraid to say that that type of movie, that type of music is gone. We still have it. We can pop in the DVDs anytime we want, but that's gone. And that's really sad because it's, you know, the music, the characteristic music going with the plot line, Indiana Jones is what stands out, right? All John Williams, all the stuff he's done, you know, ET, any of that. It's that's, that's why he is who he is. Um, and man, just at, at, all the way down to animation, family guy, Simpsons, um, just, you know, the, it, it just, it fit the bill, Dr. Who, it fit the bill. Um, and, uh, I always go for quality in what I'm listening to and what I'm working on. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, so again, to the long way around your question to, to narrow that down, there's the reasons why I listen to it. You know, there's a lot of opera fans out there. I have a very good friend who listens to a lot of opera and opera music is beautiful. It's beautiful music, but others were probably going to see have the same stance. I can't watch it because I don't know Italian. It's, I don't know what you're singing about. <laughs> you know, um, it would be so nice if operas were Americanized. You know, if you're going to perform it here, fine. If you're going to perform it in Italy, Germany, Germany, do it in German. Italy, do it in Italian. You know, can we American? Because unless you you gotta go, you gotta know the whole background. You gotta know the lyrics in every song and every aria yeah. in order to understand what's going on. Um, it, to me, it feels like um, like watching foreign films. Like, well, do you want to hear some American guys uh, dub it over in English, or like, do you want to hear the particular uh, poetry and rhythm that comes from the original language? Uh, and right. as a practical way to enjoy it one way or the other. Um, the anime crowd, you know, because part, part of my world is uh, Asian martial arts, and I think it's a prerequisite that you have to be some level of anime nerd to, to be in that. But there's an argument, ongoing argument, amongst the, um, the uh, internet trolls about the sub versus dub, and, like, which, which, one, which one makes you the real fan, like... 
are you watching it in the original language with subtitles or are you listening to uh you know the the in- english language dubbing uh i mean and it's it's overall pretty silly because you're still watching the show and enjoying whatever value the show has for you but like some people get caught up in the little you know and they, like you can't speak for one person or the other about how you enjoy or how how they enjoy um consuming their their entertainment but yep. uh i mean i've i've seen a lot of attempts uh some with opera but like um one that was interesting to me recently was uh i found uh somebody who does uh, the indian ragas i like the the song poetry and they you know they mm-hmm. have the, the big uh whatever sitar yeah the sitar and the you know they're but uh he he went through great great pains to uh to translate them to English in a satisfying way that was still kind of, you know, like communicated the art of it, but that you could, he, you could understand ah. the meaning of it. Um, I mean, I, I understand why, yeah, you because know, I've, I've been in and out of opera, the opera world It's it's, I, I enjoy playing for them, but um, actually I, I've rarely seen opera because I've usually been in the pit for it. <laughs> And like right, right. all that stuff's behind me and I'm just kind of imagining yeah. the action. Um, I think the one time I did see a performance, it was the live, like what was actually happening on stage was a lot more disappointing compared to what was happening in my head. <laughs> I just decided. What is cool, what is very cool about um, the, the, the modern day productions now that you can sometimes, just depends on what opera company you're, you're watching, uh, if they will broadcast the whole thing on YouTube and you don't have to pay for it, they'll put the whole mm. three, four hour thing um, is what they can do with the sets and the costumes and the lighting. It's really cool that I can appreciate. But again, yeah. and the music is beautiful. It's beautifully done. La Forza del Destino. I mean, you can't get any better than that, um, but you still don't know what they're singing about. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's, yeah, it takes that's a little scholarship to sit. Uh, it takes a little scholarship to sit and like, okay, what, what is it? And I don't know, uh, maybe it's the language nerd in me for some of it, but hearing yeah. some, some people's, uh, you know, the, the librettist who, uh, who will put like little, little plays on the language, little inside jokes that, you know, if you, if you're Italian or German and you understand the language, like, Oh, that's a very clever play on words or, or uh, you know, something like that. But it, that's a level, that's a layer of enjoyment that's lost on the average you know, the average listener, because, you know, we're right. not all multilingual, like expert multilingual uh, musicians. I don't right. know. I mean, I guess it depends on the level you want to enjoy any of these art forms. But I agree, like, um, if you're just playing opera for the average person, there's only so far they can appreciate or understand because it's it's a foreign art form. Yeah. Um, but, I mean talking about um you know your musical theater and, and and all that i feel like you know american culture as young as it is compared to these other your like old world uh cultures uh i feel like that's that's the beginning attempts at grasping it like similar grasp at that type of art form well i was gonna say i i've always thought as the american stage musical as americanized opera you know, it's not about a death. Well, some some plots like uh, Carousel has a has a death in it, um, but instead of all this, you know, death and gloom, you know, and all the, you know, because about royalty families and that's what all the the operas are about. They have different storylines, but most everything is sung. Where, but the difference is there's like no spoken dialogue in opera. Mm. But you know, in a, in the American musical, we take a break from we will sing a song, all production over, and done, and then we'll you know, have conversation, and then another one comes along. So you know, really, the American stage musical is like you know, um, you know, the st- I, I said that wrong. The stage musical is like American opera. That's kind of how I've always thought of it. You know, um, with of course the dialogue inserted, and it's in English that we can all understand. Um, so, uh, and there are, uh, on the same token, there are just some shows that I do not like, and I hope I never do. <laughs> I never get hired to do because I just don't care for their storyline. I don't care for uh, how the music is written. But you know, again, a different taste for different people. So, yeah, I, it's nice to. 
I mean, for freelance performing, it's nice to be able to kind of pick and choose. Because I, I agree, there's cer- certain things that I don't like to play because they just irritate me now. You know, they're not, it's nothing like inherently morally wrong with <laughs> with any of that. But yeah, no. like for instance, uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't enjoy playing Christmas shows anymore. It um, Just anything Christmas is so aggravating to me anymore i mean it's consistent work because it comes around every year and right right. i'll be damned if i'm not playing exactly the same music uh, i played every single year prior in one form or another but um so it's it's not that hard it just it it irritates me now and i don't you're you're not alone you're not alone in that in that uh and i think some orchestras fall into the rut of you know there's always at least choral music sacred choral music there's always Hal Leonard is always churning out new stuff um and then there's the old chestnuts like the uh uh Kirby Shaw arrangement of do you hear what I hear everybody still uses that and that's from the 60s uh it's been reprinted um but there's some good stuff and uh I'll say this it's difficult to say but if we get out of christmas and go into like the the animated movie medleys that uh alfred and hal leonard are putting out by a particular arranger who i'll uh retract the name they're not good Mm. the older stuff like uh the musical medleys done by like robert russell bennett and and arrangers like that that stuff is gold because it sounds very Anderson-esque. Not that it all has to be fun stuff. Um, then you have composers like David Mislanka, you know, or Joseph Schwantner, who uh, you know are are really on the out there, and I appreciate that because they do go out there and stretch the the limits of that sort of thing. Um, possibilities are are limitless in any genre, opera, because you can use some kind of unique instrument that isn't usually used, say if you use a saxophone in opera, okay? Um, and gave it some kind of prominent soloistic line that interplayed with a, a stage character. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, pop music has used a whole bunch of, you know, you know, bad example, but you know, like a rubber ball on a gong or something. Um, and, you know, the, there's lots of ways to stretch out that people haven't realized yet. it hasn't all been done yet but you know going back to what i said about you know edm and club music it's just like it's it's it really is in its own little uh corner you know it, it can only go so far and it's just a whole lot of programmed loops and all that and it's just you know there's there's a lot of people out there that don't yeah. care for it and i won't take my valuable time to listen to it all right so. i mean to be fair to that particular art form like it's not meant to necessarily just sit down and listen and appreciate <laughs> you're you're in there and like it's it's a it's a um it, it's to uh motivate movement in a particular setting right uh, usually right. with or often uh in my observation often with the assistance of substances fun for fun well that's what you know and that's what club music is kind of for and what it's yeah. become uh and i don't i must live under too many rocks but i don't see too many clubs operating anymore not, maybe not right now i have uh let's say in my other life uh i i've worked the door at certain establishments and uh that world still exists um i mean i haven't made i haven't been out on a call like that since all the lockdown things started but um that community is alive and well in, in, uh, in its particular environment. Um, but yeah, I feel like, I feel like a lot of the other forms of music that we appreciate, like there's a, there's an element of it where, you know, there you're at some level expected to sit and like listen, digest, appreciate, um, you know, I mean, even, even jazz, like there's some, you know, there's, there's some level like, yeah, you're up and moving to it, but then there's, there's a world to it where you're also sitting and like listening and digging in. It's like kind of an intellectual exercise as well. Did you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the kind of 
the the headier stuff. And, and, and I, I appreciate it all, but it's you know like cert you know some of that music seems like it belongs with something else in order to uh, like really really get it. Uh, I, I had a talk with you know we were talking earlier about um, movie uh, movie music. Um, I was talking to somebody who just like that seems like that's all she listens to and that's real that's all the type of music that really moves her um and other forms of music that were let's say written more with a more for the listening like of with its own for its own sake um just doesn't yeah. doesn't seem to attach or like doesn't seem to move the wheels the same way um yeah yeah i don't know but again you know um us music geeks will buy those soundtracks and, you know, just sit in the living room one day and, and listen to it to see what we missed. Cause of course, you know, when there's dialogue, they're going to bring it down. Right. And, um, but the, I mean, again, just the, the, the character that it puts in like the thing that's standing out of my mind right now is uh, the last crusade, Indiana Jones and, and their uh, Jones and his dad are, are in the, uh, motorcycle and sidecar and are running away from the Germans in the countryside. And like, you know, all of that, you know, if you didn't have the music, all you'd hear is motorcycle sounds and you have, you know, turning corners and all. So that the music is a character, right. You know, uh, to, to all of that. So to, to propel the story. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, 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 have you seen some of those? There, there's some, um, uh, people have done videos where they'll remove they'll remove the music from certain like music videos or from like certain certain clips and then it's just like awkward <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll send you some clips I, i've seen i've seen a handful of them where, where it's like out of a music video and it's just michael jackson making uh like guttural movement sounds while he moves in front of the camera and like there's just no musical context anymore Oh, those I, I'd like to see that. Those I haven't seen, because I love Michael Jackson's music. But um, those I haven't seen, but uh, you know, no, do send them. But I think I've seen something similar like Soul Train. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> you know, oh, and all the couples are dancing and all you hear is like, you know, clinking of footsteps and all that. Right, and so, right. uh, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah well, you know, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll add some of those to the show notes. But it's okay. it, it's really it's really telling how how important uh, the music can be for the context of what you're watching uh, or, or yep. uh, experiencing. So. Absolutely. These are fun, fun rabbit trails. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, trailing back to, um, you know, the teaching world. Uh, you've been in, in the classroom and uh, you know, in the private teaching uh, world as well. Do you have, and, we, and we've certainly talked about, uh some of these things earlier but uh any any broad general advice for students let's let's say for the uh like the the school school band student first like anything for them always work to be better always try to better yourself do it better than you did the previous day uh never be afraid to seek advice, whether it be from your band director or your private teacher. Sometimes there can be conflicts of thought between those two parties and the student is put in the middle. But, um, you know, however we work that out, we work that out, sometimes take a little from both sides. Mm. But um, a lot of what I've found in students' uh, downfalls is that they're just, they're afraid to ask. Uh, they're sheepish to ask. And, you know, if you don't, if, if you never don't ask the question, the stupid question is the one that's never asked, right? So, you know, how can I make this fingering easier? Oh, I didn't know there was an alternate fingering for that. Well, you didn't ask until I observe it and see, whoa, you know, why are you doing it this way? And, you know, this is, this is really the more facile way in this scenario. Um, so always do better than you did the previous day. Never be afraid to ask. Never be afraid to ask to branch out, you know. Um, if you want to do something extra, can I play a duet with somebody? Can I do, and some of them don't even know that this exists, but like, a, you know, a quartet or what have you, small ensemble. 
even before the solo and ensemble years come up, before we put them together ourselves. Yeah. Um, but you know, you always have, you always have the ones that, uh, I did want to say this cause I, I saw this in your chat with, I think Ginsburg, um, cause we've all been there. Uh, we all know that there are those students, the private students, they take the lessons because they want to do it and their heart is in it. And you can just, you can just sense that. And, uh, not all the time, but there are some of the times and you have to be forward about this. I only had, oh, I had a couple, but I'm just going to narrow it down to one. Um, I had one student who was very good at theater, but since I also did theater and lessons in the same place, she started taking piano lessons. And usually my, I, again, I never underestimate the conceptual power of a student. Just because they're young, doesn't mean that they're gonna, you know, they're like a sponge, they're gonna grab everything. That is the rewarding part. But, so what I was gonna say is, all my uh, piano students, I use the Faber method, uh, mm -hmm. Randall and Nancy Faber, good books, and they're flying through, you know, they're doing such a, you know, it, it, it's put together so well, and you know, week to week, you know, they're flying through them. Um, but I had one student who, uh, and the mom wasn't, didn't have a pushy personality, but I knew the mom was putting the daughter into lessons. And week after week, this, this young girl came in and was spinning her wheels, was on the same exercise for weeks, same song for weeks. And it was either fingering or rhythm or something that she wasn't getting. And, you know, it's just exercise sitting next to him, exercising extreme patience and getting through that half hour lesson because, uh, and I think one day I finally broke and I said, do you want to be here? And, um, she didn't miss a beat. She said, no. And it wasn't me. It wasn't the instrument. It's not like she'd be rather be playing tuba. It's just she didn't want to be doing it. Mom was pushing her into doing it. It's just one of those things, okay, I need to find a hobby for my child. And again, it's not to condemn all parents, but as we know, some parents do that. So, and I, I had a very good relationship with the mom. The, the husband, the dad, took lessons from me for a while. The son took lessons from me for a while. He did really well, very, but it doesn't filter down to every child, you know, and they only had two kids. So I was very comfortable in going to the mom and say, Mrs. J, I said, uh, it, it's, it's not there. Her heart is not in it. And she just doesn't have the desire. So I wouldn't ever say this on a daily basis, but I think it's time to stop. Um, I don't want you to waste your money. I, another student could, it's not about wasting my time. It's, you know, another student could get into, you know, because I did, again, did so many things. Um, that, you know, some rarely, there are those rare occasions where you have to say that, uh, mm -hmm. just for the benefit of everyone, more for the student, less for the teacher. So, um, but again, the ones who take lessons, private clarinet lessons with you, those students are going to audition for IMEA. They're going to go into college and major in either education or performance. They want to be there. The other ones, um, you know, we know that, that middle school kids join band because their friends did it and they're only going to play in high school and they never touch the instrument again. That's okay. That happens too. Uh, but we still have to give them the same attention and the same education, whether they have tonguing problems or writing too many crutches in what, you know, what we talked about. Um, do better the day you did before. And always, you know, once you lose the desire, it's time to go. Right. So that's that. Um, now let's say for uh, somebody looking into maybe starting a career in arranging uh, and uh, that, that kind of work, uh, any, any uh, additional advice for them uh, setting out? Um, this is completely contradictory to what my method is, but uh, usually with everything that's put out there now in whatever instrumentation, whatever genre, 
Uh, you have to dare to be different. Mm. Um, it's like uh, everybody's seen Sister Act, right? And that uh, uh, it's a great arrangement of, uh, you know, Hail Holy Queen is a standard, very, you know, it's not solemn, but it's just, you know, there uh, kind of hymn. And when you put a gospel twist on it, which is taking something and then make, transforming it into another style, uh, everybody loved that, you know. Uh, gospel music, love it, love it, you know. Um, and you can do that, I mean, you can do that with anything. Like I said earlier about my friend Mark making a Latin version out of chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Um, so you can dare to be different to do that, uh, but also um, know, know what your possibilities are, know the, uh, the range and the, and the uh, capabilities and non-capabilities of every instrument that you're writing for. And if you're not sure about something, I'll be very honest, I, um, percussion is my weakest, and strings, to be very honest, are my weakest uh, areas of knowledge. And I reach out to string players that I know and percussionists that I know to ask, is this too crazy? Uh, have you seen this? How, sometimes, how do I do this? I will do, I'm not, don't ever be afraid to ask for knowledge. Because a lot of people, um, when they're starting out, everybody has to start somewhere and not everybody knows everything. That's okay. But um, just know what you're doing. And if you don't, or if you get stuck, don't be afraid to ask. Ask a colleague or anybody that you can reach out to to get that advice. Um, but if you, if you are going the route that I go and to, I don't like to use the word copy, I like to use the word recreate because really that's what it is. If you're going to go the recreation route, uh, again, strong statement. But if you're if you can't get it right, again, ask or don't do it at all. Mm. Um, because if you and sometimes you have to write a transition. Sometimes uh, they ask for a different key. Um, I did a whole bunch of arrangements. I I, I can't give it out because it'll give it away. Uh, I just recently, earlier this year, did a whole bunch of arrangements that were for by a prominent artist that were to be put in a different key and that the form was chopped up, I, which is to say uh, deviated from the originals that everybody knows. Hmm. So what, um, what the contractor or what the client didn't know is that I did two versions. I did an A version of the real one. And then I did the B version, which I will publish. And then I did the B version of what they asked for, which is beneficial for me because I can take all that source material from version A and all I have to do is do a mass copy and paste thanks to computers and just, you know, do this and alter it. That's all you had to do. So there's two different schools of thought. If you're, you know, you can take uh, a song and, and completely, you know, turn it on its side and do something different or do the recreation route. And, um, but again, it's just like with uh, students, instrumental students, don't ever be afraid to ask. Don't, don't be, don't be, uh, don't feel, don't lose your confidence because you don't know everything. We all have to look things up from time to time. And, um, you know, so, <laughs> sometimes I still have to, uh, when I write heart parts, a lot of people don't know this, but um, as just to give an example, uh, I've learned that harpists, some of them like it when you put in the pedalings and some of them don't like that and they want to do their own thing. Some mm. people don't know, some arrangers don't know what they're doing. But I always, uh, and you're not supposed to write a key signature with a harp. I do, because I want them to know what key they're in, or the key that's going on. So I, I still have to look because it's opposite. A harp diagram has all the diatonic notes on the diagram. It goes D, C, B, big line, E, F, G, A. And if, the, if a long line is on the plane, that means the, the string is, all the D strings are in the natural position. Every D you 
pluck or play is going to be D natural. If you put the pedal up, in our minds, we think that raises things, but that's actually flat. We normally connotate flat with down, right? But if it's in the up position and you put the marking above the line, so if I put D up here, that means D flat, not D sharp. I, you know, I sometimes have to look that up. I think I finally got it. It's like Victor Borga. You know, I have to tell you, there were three things that I never remember. <laughs> right. So, you know, I, I have to do that. Um, and, and then, re of course, reversely, sharp is down, you know, and that's just, it's so, you know, yeah. So, um, yeah, never be afraid to ask for what you don't know, because this is silly, but it's true. You don't know what you don't know. Agreed. I certainly don't. <laughs> um, nice. What, um, this could be for uh, either or any body of, of students. Uh, do you have any particular books, media, or resources that you'd recommend? Um, um, books. Well, media, I mean, the media of today is, is so easily accessible and so varied. Uh, we can find licensed music on YouTube. We can find DIY videos on YouTube. We can get virtual lessons on YouTube. Um, and as we know now, I've done very little of it, but doing lessons through Zoom. Um, as long as we don't have the latency thing going on, we're good. Uh, but, uh, you know, no, of course, nothing beats one-on-one, -on -one, but of course, right now we have those restrictions. So as far media, I'm going out of order, but media... I think is in a great place right now and it's being used more, excuse me, more and more and more. Um, books. I never strayed away from the Rubank, specifically clarinet or saxophone. Never strayed away. Basically any wind instrument never strayed away from those Rubank books and all the levels that they have because they're methodical. They build and, um, even though they're old, they're what, 80 years old now, 90 years old, um, was since when they were first published, they just, you, you can't beat those. Uh, not to say that like the Rose Etudes and the, the Close book, they have their uses, but they're, you know, of course they touch on different areas. They're more Etudes, they're more, um, you know, the use of, you know, like trill fingerings, to alternate stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, those, those are great too, but they're, uh, you know, for different uses, but instructional books, I, you know, you just can't, you can't get away from that for saxophone, the Fairling book, of course, the bossy book for etudes. Um, and not to, again, not to be a copycat, but all of the standard books and I have PDF versions of all of them, um, from flute down to two or down to percussion, uh, all the books that they, that they extract the etudes from for ILMEA every year. Well, the three cycle year and which is probably what every state does. I, I'm not really, I really don't know, yeah. but um, you know, they, they become the book like the Arbins for trumpet. They become the book for a reason. Um, and just because I've used them and there was a, there was a, a method book that I used as when I was a kid for piano, I don't think they're, um, published anymore so i won't even mention them but the, the the faber books that i mentioned with piano are great the hand and exercises the scalar exercises for that are great um and i really encourage even though it's kind of over people's heads i really encourage self-education on as much theory that you can pack into your head and take your time because music is printed music and its laws, its theory are, are different beast. It's like learning, you know, if I wanted to start tomorrow learning French and I, you know, me, no par les vows francaises. Um, you got to take your time in order for it to sink in and don't worry because one day it will click. It's not going to click right away. There are still, I know adults that still have a hard time spelling a dominant seventh chord in whatever uh, instance they have to do it because they don't use it. Me, I'm using that stuff all the time. And we really, when we're playing, when we're playing an etude, we should 
sometimes when we sit down to play that etude, we should think, and even for younger students, even when things are basic and very stepwise, diatonically stepwise, you should be thinking about, yeah, okay, I, I know how to finger this and I know what I'm doing here. And it's rhythmically simple. But take some time to think, this is a whole step. C to D is a whole step. E to F now is a half step. And then you throw in the quirks, you throw in the accidentals, A flat to B flat, whole step. You know, the tiny little things that you can piece together. <laughs> it's kind of like Terminator with the, with, when, the, when, the, when the, you know, you shoot the, the, the uh, whatever it is, T-1000 and all, you know, it melts. And then you see all the little puddles of all the, all these pieces. The music theory is so puzzleistic but it's applicable in everything that you do. Mm. You know, I, but I, I've known some college people. I had a very good friend from high school. He went to a different college and, and uh, graduated with an, with an ed degree. And he came out not knowing what the Picardy third was. Okay. So you spent a lot of money and you don't know what a Picardy third is. Yeah. Um, that's not good. You know, things like that. Uh, and not everybody has to be an expert, but you know, I'm saying this because it will help you as an individual. It will help you understand aural and visual music so much better. You'll process it and be able to emote more, do more with it, be more creative if you have that understanding. You and I have a, a mutual friend, and I can say this because we've had this discussion with him, I have, uh, with our mutual friend that, uh, well, I, you know, I, I have such a hard time with this because I don't know theory. So they admit it. There's probably a lot of people out there that are like that. It's never too late to go back, pull out the book. Okay, how is a dominant seventh chord constructed? What are the intervals between each? And that may not sound important to some people, but you know, it's kind of like you wouldn't be able to spell or write if you didn't know vowel sounds and all 26 characters of the alphabet. And that goes for any language. Music is just another language. It's just without the sound, if we take this, all the sound elements out of it, it's all in print. Mm. So um, that is how I can do my work so easily because I have that piano background. And I, I didn't say this before, talk about geek. When I was in middle school, my brothers, my older brothers had already gone through theory and oral skills and their old books were at home. There you go. So I went into those crates, pulled out the books, started reading. Not everybody does that, but I'm saying that because where I'm at today, I would not be where I'm at today, be able to do what I can do if I didn't self-educate myself on that stuff. And here's a great example. I was going to say this. We've all sat in theory and oral skills and we don't take it until college. And I feel that that stuff should be covered way earlier because we remember the choral majors in oral skills and when they have to sing something back or when they have to do dictation it's just one of these mm. and they can't do it but the instrumentalists can which is odd but and this is a global problem and i'm proud to say this we don't teach our vocalists how to read that is a major problem. Teaching by rote is not a bad thing, but it's not the best thing. If we do the little building blocks, like I said, we start with major seconds. Minor seconds are hard to sing. Major seconds, diatonic scales, on solfege. You will do your choir wonders, but we're just not teaching it. Everything is by rote. And the other downfall to that is it takes so much time to put a four part, four voice part song together to do that. If you've ever been in a choir rehearsal, and I have as an accompanist, think about if a band or orchestra played a march, a two to three minute march, and had to learn all the parts by rote. Everybody sits silent. Right, you're shaking your head. Okay, flutes. I want you to play beam bum ba dum bum 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 and now here's how you finger it. Dee da dee dun da. Imagine how long that would take. And that's what a lot of choirs are doing. 
I should be able to give, I would love to be able to give any vocalist, especially in musicals, give them a piece of music and they can do it. Not perfectly the first time, but get 75% of it. That would be my ideal world. Maybe a lot of people might agree. And Frank, quite honestly, there's probably a lot of teachers out there who don't feel confident enough in themselves to to teach it. And Mm -hmm. that's why they don't do it. Um, Again, that's another bold statement. But so again, going back to my, don't be afraid to self-educate, get the books out. And, you know, instead of, you know, watching Netflix or, you know, playing Candy Crush, you know, get your book out and self-exercise. You know, do, sit down at a keyboard, do a little bit of, of, of dictation, because that's what all that stuff is for. I really think that's all packed into the college education. And it's so hard for people to get through those classes. I mean, we know people who uh, transfer out or change their major just because they don't understand that material. It's just foreign to them because we're not exposing that early enough. We have to change that system. Mm. We really do. Even if it's just a little bit, um, we don't have general music class in, in uh, junior high or high school. And we should, we really should. It's, it's easier said than done, but you know, to learn the basic language and, to even do a little bit of dictation, you know, to get their feet wet. And I'm not just saying that for the, but, you know, like we have to learn all this other stuff in school that we're not going to use in the rest of our life. Well, you're going to learn the music stuff and you're not going to use that either. So why not? You know, um, basic stuff, note values, names of the staff, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, it's good. That's a uh, tall order for, uh, <laughs> it is but, it is but it's, it, you know the the benefits uh certainly loom large we'll see how uh how our audience and the uh the world of music education uh, takes to it see how see what we can do from here um yeah. good uh wh- what else do you do um because we're not working all the time is there uh anything Anything outside of your music, uh, your music world that uh, you you care to mention about your your personal life? I'm I'm pretty simplistic. Uh, I I uh, I'm easily pleased, but I just I I'm really simple. I can I can get enjoyment just by uh, going to a new restaurant I haven't been to before, trying a different food or style of food that I haven't done, going to a, a park or a landmark or even a town that I haven't been to before, of course, experienced a lot of that on the road and, uh, and will in the future. But, um, uh, and I, I really don't like to admit that I'm a, a homebody. I would like to get out more and we of course can't do that now. Um, I've always been a nostalgia person. Uh, I don't really watch a lot of new movies or new TV series as is, is, I'll go back and watch, you know, the old stuff just because I, I love it. So, um, but, uh, as far as that and connecting with media, like we talked about huge Simpsons fan have been since day one, mm-hmm. December of 1989, uh, modern Seinfeld, well. Simpsons are, uh, among our modern day prophets, right? That's right. That's right. Well, There's predictions. We, we can't get on this. We can't get on the subject of the composer, but, um, mm. Or the, or the now composer, but anyway, um, but uh, yeah, but you know, it's it's sad to say, uh, free time and personal time, with the way we, we musicians have to work, gets that margin gets smaller and smaller. So the more time you'd like to, or just general hanging out and going to spending time with with friends, loved ones, and visiting them as often as we can do it. It can't be every weekend. Uh, now I work on the weekends, so or like day job work on the weekends. So that's, and, uh, whenever this all lifts up, what I, what I really hope for is that for music and for life in general, or like going to concerts, you know, I've been to probably 10, 15 Chicago concerts in my lifetime. I'd love to go see the symphony again. I haven't seen them in a long time. Chicago symphony. Yeah. Um, I really hope 
that after all this lifts up and, and whenever the barrier is lifted and, you know, it finally dies down, I think uh, people are going to have uh, a newfound taste for life in general, outdoor activities, because we're all shut in or restricted. And in the music world too, everybody's off tour. Nobody can be public. And that is just, it's going to be like a, uh, not a reformation, but it's going to be like a second coming because everybody's going to be back in their seasons again. And that goes for everybody. It goes for yeah. rock concerts. It goes for orchestras, um, even school bands, you know, march bands. And uh, that's what I'm really hoping for is that, you know, we're all going to be able to enjoy that again. I, again, I'm pretty simple. I enjoyed a lot of the things that people go out and do. Um, but on the other side of that, I said, I don't like it being admitting that I'm a homebody, but my, and anybody who's done arranging and you got to do your own parts, it's so incredibly time consuming. And really that's why a lot of people don't want to do it because it's just so, it's a time sucking abyss. And it is. Um, I have spent a calendar year from this point extracting parts for songs that I never extracted parts for. Mm. It's like 300 songs. That's a lot of time. You know, is it, does it get boring? Oh yeah, but it's gotta be done. And you're not gonna hire out a secretary to do it. So, but if you wanna produce the product, that's what's gotta be done. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty simple. Any, uh, any books or media in your, in your small sliver of free time that you're enjoying right now, you wanna mention? Um, in the recent past, yes, I'm not much of a, I, I do like to read very few times in my life. I've actually kicked back on the couch on a Saturday and read an entire book from beginning to end. Um, and that's, it's been very few, but, uh, I read a murder mystery. I read a, a biography of actually, uh, Ron Modell from, uh, who was a retired jazz band director at, uh, Northern and he wrote a bio, an autobiography about from his very beginning. So that was very interesting because I really didn't know him that all that well. Um, I was a part of a book. Uh, there was a, a gentleman that followed us around on the road uh, in June of last year that uh, thought it would be a great idea to interview every member on, of the band, of the 18, 19 person band, um, how they got on, what their backgrounds were, kind of similar to what you're doing and uh, with this series and uh, find out what they like to do in their personal life and, and all that. So uh, that book is not out yet. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that out loud, but um, it's going to be, it'll be out probably in the next year or two. So I'll just uh, do a long curse word bleep right there and people can just imagine what they want. No, I think it's, I think it's, I think, I think it's okay, but um, I don't know if it'll be just digital or if it's going to go into print, but um yeah, but I just, about budgeting my time, I'd, lo I'd like to read more. I really do like to do it. But, uh, you know, once I do that, I'm, I'm so tied, you know, I'm so married to my work, sorry to say. But, uh, you know, if I'm reading or something like that, then I'm not working on whatever, you know. Right. So uh, that, I mean, my, really the way I wind down is I, I watch my Disney Plus or my Netflix to you know, clear my head for the day. I got to watch my comedy. I got to watch my Simpsons. I have 15 seasons to catch up on. So I got a lot to do. Uh, I like to cook. Uh, I like to try different things that way. But um, sometimes when I'm too hungry and I want to eat right now, you know, I'll do the, the speedy things. But, um, uh, you know, so when I, when I allot the time and when I can, you know, snack on something as I'm preparing a big meal, I've done Thanksgiving on my own before. And I really like doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, try, you ever, you know, you try to copy a recipe that's, that's out there. Like if you try to, to make your own uh, white cheddar mac and cheese, like Panera does, you may not get it just right, but you know, you'll try it. And so I, yeah. I've done things like that before, but, um, but yeah, you know, in the work, you know, the work that we do in the way that we got to survive sometimes as freelancers and contractors, uh, we're working all the time. So, uh, it's, it's hard to find that, but when you, when you get it, take it. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I personally, I need to take, or I need, I need to carve out time deliberately for that. Cause I, I, 
I feel like I need to actively tie myself to some some level of humanity, <laughs> and it doesn't just yeah. get, you know trapped in you know technical. I actually, and this is going to sound lame. Um, you said trapped in that. Uh, I have a really big, I sound like I'm a hundred percent Irish, but I'm only 25% Irish. I'm mostly German. And so I'm already screwed up. Um, and I have a really, but I have a really big Irish Catholic family. So I have aunts in Colorado and cousins there. I have a lot of cousins on the East coast in the Boston area. Um, and there are a lot of, in, in Illinois and I have spent, you know, we're all getting older and, uh, me just turning 40. I, uh, this was a couple of years ago. I started, you know, I'm really haven't been in contact with my extended family. Uh, my immediate family, you know, we, we talk all the time. We talk once a week mm. or more. And with all my aunts and uncles and cousins, you know, we've lost touch. Cause again, everybody's got the work and day life. They're not all musicians. We're the only musician family, by the way, um, immediate family. But uh, about three years ago, I started to, start reaching out two years ago, started reaching out to everybody because one day they may not be there. And so, uh, you know, it's high time, it, especially during this pandemic time, we're all, climbing, we're all saying we're climbing the walls, but we're finding things to do to keep ourselves occupied if we can't go out and work. And you and I are in that, you know, somewhat in that bubble um, or that, that bubble of the Venn diagram, you know? So, uh, you got to, you got to keep your mind occupied or else you'll just go, you know, we all suffer from boredom, but, uh, I've been through a stage in that in my life. And just one day I was like, that's it. I just snapped and I got up and, and got back to normal, you know? So, uh, uh, everybody's, everybody's got an IEP. Everybody's got a different plan that they got to go with. So, uh, do as the kids say, you do you, you know, do, do what works for you. So, um, that's all I have to say about that. Gotcha. What's, uh, digging a little deeper. Uh, what's something that you used to believe that you don't believe anymore? <laughs> um, doesn't have to be I'll, like crazy or outlandish, but you know, I used to believe that, uh, everything you could learn was in school and from books. Mm. And I said this way earlier. Yeah, that's a big part of it, but it's not everything. And I'll repeat experience is the best teacher. And also, uh, if this is kind of a reverse, but I never wanted to believe the phrase. It's not what you know, it's who, you know, that is also true. Uh, and also to a degree because you could hire, <laughs> I hired a bass player for a musical once who was actually a clarinet player. He said, Oh, I play bass. I, I have really hard time finding basses in this particular area. Hmm. So like, I play bass. Okay. Guy missed more notes than he played. Right. And of course I'm doubling him on my left hand. So <laughs> a lot of conflict there. Never hired him again you know um so that's a person i knew but there are things that he didn't know like how to do this right <laughs> so uh you know who takes a gig on an instrument that they're not confident on this person did so next but uh and you have to be that cutthroat when you're a director of a pit. I mean, you just can't, you can't have that. So yeah, I, I never wanted to believe that phrase. It's what you know, it's who, you know, um, having contacts is obviously, as we all know, very helpful, but, um, I also have a very low tolerance level for, I, I believe it's, it's both. It really is what you know as well. Um, I didn't want to get to this subject, but this is what's popping in my head now. So I will say it. There is a uh, particular university in the state where I sat under three conductors. One was, um, two were filling in on a sabbatical at the time. So I, I got to play under all three of them eventually. The first one, we'll call, we'll call him S. Uh, we can't do that. We'll call him L. Uh, was 
just about to start a remote program in getting his doctorate in wind conducting. He hasn't started it yet. Great conductor. And I don't mean just this, I mean style, interpretation, everything. Then um, sat under uh, the next one who had the doctorate in wind conducting. The only faculty member at that university that had that degree. Mm. We'll skip over that for a second. And then we went to the actual conductor of that uh, particular ensemble, we'll call him S, and did not have a DMA, fantastic conductor. So the moral of the story is, there are people that have DMAs, but that doesn't automatically make them a great conductor. The person who had the DMA was the worst conductor. And may I say, still is. Mm. So know your craft, know what you're doing. And again, never be afraid to ask. You don't get past a certain age or a certain degree point in education and think you don't have to ask anymore. I'm open about that. Some people are not, and that's okay. But nobody knows everything. All right. Opinions don't mean everything, but observations and experience do. That's why I'm not afraid to say that this particular conductor who in college was snapping during rehearsal as if we can hear that and always never saw the whites of their eyes and always had their head down in the score because they didn't know the score well enough to communicate. I am not afraid to say that because it is true. And it, that has been going on for 20 years. Oh, wow. So you may have an inkling of who that person is, but uh, that person just turned 61 and uh, needs to retire and needs to leave because they prove, they've proven themselves. Their reputation precedes them. Mm. Uh, my reputation precedes me. And that's another thing. I never thought that reputations meant anything. Oh, how wrong I was. That's it. Yeah. I've come, I've come to see that as a very important lesson, you know, the, it, and it's tied to the, who, you know, like you put out good, you, you, uh, you demonstrate uh, reliable, you know, high levels of performance and, uh, you know, miraculously success starts to find you more often, you know? Um, yeah. And I believe, I believe in that. And the, and really Frank, the truth is, is there's a good and bad side to everybody. Not everybody is all good. Not everybody is all bad. You know, we all say, you know, if we do recommendations for players or what have you, or, or a person to do a particular job, um, Oh, Frank. Yes. He's a great clarinet player, but he's got a body odor problem. <laughs> You know, Patrick, yeah, he's a great arranger, but he's not going to change the key for you, you know. So there's always the but. There's always going to be that. And, of course, you don't have a body odor problem. It's just a dopey example. Um, I think you smell lovely. But, uh, you know, we, we, all, we have all heard that sentence all the time. And so reputations and perceptions are huge. And, you know, some people don't care. Uh, I know somebody that lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue that thinks he can do no wrong. Uh, no, no. So uh, I'm not perfect in it. Like I said, I'm Jack of many things, but master of none. And, uh, but you know, all these things that I've stated about uh, teachers, not correcting things about, you know, how publishers do things, how all that, you know, we really just, we need to keep, if we all individually keep ourselves in check in what we're doing, it'd be a lot smoother road. Yeah. Well, that's what we, what we talked about earlier at the, uh, the responsibility aspect. That's personal responsibility to uphold, uphold a valuable standard. Um, that's good. Not to, not to use a dopey example, because this was a great thing to live by, but the Mary Catholic Band motto that he still uses today, he doesn't sign his name. Greg Bim doesn't sign his name. He signs it with a logo and pride. Personal responsibility in daily effort. 
that's what it is. That's, that's something I can get behind. Um, is there something I didn't ask you that I should have? Well, you didn't ask me my favorite color. No. Um, no, I, I mean, I think we, we covered it all. I, I appreciate you, uh, uh, not treating me or treating me like, uh, that I'm, uh, no, that's wrong. Yeah. I appreciate you not treating me like an instrumentalist King, you know, King of clarinet, which I am not, which I know what your series is, what you want to go for. But, uh, I, I, I thank you for asking me all of these, you know, the broad range of what have you, just because again, um, I never thought, I'd be where I am today with all the different, you know, dots that I've visited uh, in a career, so to speak. I didn't, I just said, you know, if I'm interested in something, I'm going to go with it. I, uh, I can't even tell you how I got into, excuse me, into arranging. But um, I just, I realized that I had a knack for it and thought people like what they heard. I got more requests and kept going with it. Here we are. Yeah. Um, but uh, so if uh, I know you said you put the links in there, but if people want to, uh, to search for what I've got, uh, the, really the simplest way is to go to sheetmusicplus.com, put my name in the search bar on the page, Patrick Sheehan brings up everything. And then you can sort it by like uh, the newest, uh, the, the uh, revel uh, relevance to the time of year. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, it does A to Z, so you can do that. And uh, if anybody is looking for a particular arrangement for any particular uh, instrumentation, uh, just reach out and ask me directly through uh, my name and music at uh, Patrick Sheehan Music at gmail.com. And we can connect through there. Yeah, I'll put that, I'll put that all in the show notes along with uh, the, all the other uh, links and resources you sent me. Uh, and yep. if, if anything pops in your head after that you want to add, um, I can always edit that in later. Uh, okay. So you gave the big link. Is there anything else uh, you're working on that you want to mention or uh, any other mode of contact you'd want to share? Uh, I, I usually connect with people by phone or text, you know, after we link by email. But uh, uh, you, I do have a Facebook page. Uh, not the profile, but page, but uh, I usually post right after something is published. I'll, I'll copy that and put the link to it on my page. So it's everything in order. It's, it's kind of a, there really is no order to it, but you can see everything there. So if you want to search for uh, PS music on, uh, on Facebook, you'll see uh, everything there and that's, you know, public. But um, yeah, last thing I want to tell you is uh, I just got into a new show. Um, some may know it, some may not, but unless you have HBO, Curb Your Enthusiasm with Larry David uh, is, uh, do you happen to watch that? I, I, I think that's been recommended to me more than once now. And you're, okay. you're, you're adding leverage to uh, everyone else's opinion. So Okay. Um, the reason I find it so funny is because uh, it's, an ex it's basically an extension of Seinfeld and, you know, just displaced by... Um, he actually started in 2000 and Seinfeld ended in 98. So it was only two years. However, <laughs> there's only 10 seasons right now, but he hasn't filmed a season a year. So we're in 2020 now, but there's only 10 seasons. So he's kind of been on and off, but it's an extension of Seinfeld. That's uh, the plot lines. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, humor that, that Larry David does and, you know, I just, I, I connect with that. And uh, the, the cool thing is none of the music on his show, all the incidental music, none of it is original. Uh, it's not written for the show. There isn't a show composer. All of it is a collection of stuff that's already been written and mostly not American composers. Um, lots of French waltzes, accordion, lots of um, some polkas, brass mm. band polkas circus music a um, little bit of jazz combo um, but all of the music fits perfectly and they repeat them they, they they'll overuse them uh, and only I only use about 30 seconds for cues but it's the stuff is so good it's like little piece little nuggets of gold and it's for small ensembles so if you can put together what I'm saying right now 
there's about a hundred pieces that have been used on the series and they're all very short, two, three minutes, not even that, some of them, small instrumentations. So I'm transcribing all of them and they will all be published before the end of the year. Uh, and I think it's a great opportunity as, as new stuff, even though it's not new stuff, again, all uh, Italian, French composers. But it's all lighthearted stuff like Anderson. It's, but it's like European Anderson. Great for use for small ensembles, for solo and ensemble stuff. Uh, I have to see if it meets the IH, IHSA time requirements, though. I'm not, some of them may be too short. Yeah. So, um, uh, but I think that's all like really great stuff. And uh, of course, you can't bring in an accordion into IHSA, but who, who's ever done that? Um, but that's what I'm working on now just to, to keep my mind occupied other than contract work that uh, I have on a timetable. I, I work with um, uh, come as you are kind of basis. So if, if client A says, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm asking for this, but I don't need it until December. They're still first on the list. Client B comes along and says, okay, I need this, but I need it right away. Okay, I'll take a break and I'll do yours first. So, um, Christmas is always a, a busy time of year for me or pre-Christmas because everybody wants a new arrangement. Um, so uh, where was I going with that? Oh, but the, the, the Curb Your Enthusiasm music uh, is all, will all be labeled as that. There'll be the actual title and then it'll be parenthesized, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, and it's all different uh, instrumentations and short lengths. So, you know, it's, we're not talking like 10 minute stuff, but it's just, this stuff is just so juicy and it's just so, it's just so good. It's, it's short, short and sweet and it's good. It's melodic. It's, it's compelling, which is why it's grabbing me. Um, and it's, uh, I'll, it's really hard to pick one, but I'll, I'll send you a link to one YouTube uh, playback where you can, where people can listen to it. It's just, uh, if they know the series or not, it's just, it's great stuff. You know, it's just so it's good. That's all I can say. Nice. I double bonus. I, I enjoy uh, when food adjectives are used for other things. So, Juicy. Yes. Moist. Spicy. Uh, crispy. Yes. Crispy. <laughs> Those are words are hey. fun. <laughs> but, words are fun. Um, great. So this has been a um, long, rich girthy some might say uh interview with mr uh patrick sheehan um, it's been spicy yes spicy crispy and moist uh all the best all the best food adjectives um so you can you can find him at or make contact with him at uh patrick sheehan music at gmail um dot com for those of you who couldn't figure that last part out and uh the various assortment of links that will be in the show notes. Uh, thank you again for this uh, thick, thick and wide slice of your time. Uh, hey, we're, not, we're all not doing anything. So, yes. Uh, so, but yeah, it's, I think it's great. You, I know there's part of our, the audience out there who has got a broad interest and maybe has a proclivity for some of these things and might need, might need some direction to, to grow it into something um, uh, that, that moves them and that moves the needle for, uh, for the rest of the field. So uh, I'm glad you took the time. Uh, we're, we'll definitely do this again um, at some point. Uh, and yeah, if you want to narrow down to certain subjects and we will both work hard to not deviate, uh, I am, I am all for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it's value is value. So I'm, I'm glad to keep putting it out there uh, as you're, as you're willing and able. So, um, yes. thank, thank you. Then, and if you're watching this slash listening to this, thank you for, uh, sticking with us to this point. Uh, we'll yes, stick out some small clips as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, great value. Then thanks again. Uh, I'll see you soon. Uh, All right. Uh, thanks, Frank.
I've got to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs>